All right. Hey, first of all, thanks a lot, man. I, I appreciate you coming on here. Like we kind of were just talking about, I was uh, just going back over your notes that you sent me and uh, talk about some ups and downs. I mean, you, you have had, you've, in my mind, it seems like you've done it all with regard to um, experiences. Like you've, you've been at one of the most elite units you could possibly be at. You've been, you know, you were conventional, you had some issues. I mean, it's just, it's a fascinating story. Uh, so I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing, hearing all about it. No, uh, thanks man. And I appreciate it. Uh, one of the things that I don't know if you realize this, um, is when you ask guys to write this kind of synopsis, I don't know if it's therapy for dudes or if it's uh, a lot of introspection. I don't know what other guys have said to you. Um, but it was, it was interesting. Cause I mean, I, I thought about my career, but I haven't kind of like tied it all together per se. Um, you know, so it was right. It's like, man, like, what did I do? Uh, <laughs> and uh, right. to your point, yeah, I, I do think um, my career was a little interesting. Um, I did cover a, a, a breadth and depth of experience, and you know, I think I had a fairly um, diverse experience. <laughs> oh, for sure, um, phenomenal and, one, I think. I mean, yeah, there's a couple of. We call them low points, whatever you want to call them. But uh, yeah. the, the the thing I like the most about the whole thing, and, and we'll get into it, is that look where you you came out the other side. Like a lot of guys feel like, and I've had dudes on here that have had run into some snags and had some hiccups, and they've overcome just like you did. And it's I think it's a testament to these guys who maybe these young guys have an early on, um, you know, like a roadblock. It, it can be overcome. Like the, there's nothing, there's no not a whole lot of showstoppers out there. I guess is no, kind of the point. Yeah. Um, no, for sure. And, uh, it was just it, like some things happened. I did not expect to have happen, you know, and, uh, <laughs> right. there's, there's some really, really down points. Um, but, uh, man, like, you know, like not to fast forward, but to jump ahead to today, like, <laughs> dude, everything's awesome. It's great. Right. Uh, exactly. you know, but it didn't feel like that sometimes. Sure. You know? And I, I, I mean, I, I don't, I want to, I don't want to talk like, um, it only happens to other people. I, I was in the same boat. I mean, I've, I've had a ton of, you know, missteps and, you know, mistakes I've made. And, uh, I, I think the, the rule that I think you could probably agree to this, if you just keep plugging away, don't let it get you down. I mean, eventually you'll come out the other side and it'll be fine. I mean, it's, you know, there's nothing yeah. that you can't overcome for sure. My, my tongue in cheek saying always is like, I'm, I'm too dumb to know I shouldn't. Um, so somehow I just ended up doing it anyway. Um, right. right. (laughs) And maybe I don't don't know what that means necessarily, but like, I just kept going. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and had an amazing career in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I think that's the perfect like kind of way to sum it up. Like just keep going. You know, a lot of guys think that they, they give up or they, they think there's nothing left for them to do, but there, there always is. There's always something you can do. Always. There's another Avenue you can go down or something. So. Yeah, I think so. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, let's get into it. Let's. Uh, I, I, you're. Um, I definitely want to hear about. You said you had a Medal of Honor uh, winner in your family, and you've. Uh, you know, your and your your childhood is not the typical childhood. I mean, so th- I definitely want to hear about. <laughs> let's start there. Let's start start about. You know, you and your uh, you and your brothers. Uh, start. From yeah. When you guys were adopted and all that stuff, and we'll just go from there. Yeah, sure. So, um, I was adopted probably when I was four. I think. Um, I was the youngest of three boys. Um, my parents, and I'm gonna try to make this make sense. Um, so <laughs> my parents, my, my biological parents, um, were not very well suited for, for children, um, from a behavioral standpoint. <laughs> um, so we actually, my brothers and I spent a lot of time in foster homes, um, for, for most of my really early childhood. Um, and then, um, uh, my grandparents on my biological mother's side. Um, so my maternal grandmother, uh, her and her second husband, which, which is where I get the last name Knippel from, uh, her mm-hmm. and her second husband, uh, adopted all three of us in like a, like a package deal essentially. Nice. Um, so, uh, yeah, so me and my three brothers, or two brothers, sorry, uh, got adopted, um, took the last name Knippel, which I'm like, I'm like, really like my, I love my last name, not because it sounds funny. Um, but, uh, I was just raised to be really proud of our last name and that it meant something. And, uh, you know, I'm actually really proud of being a pinnacle and, and, um, because I was adopted, I, I was given a family essentially of like, of really high performing people that like, 
they're doctors or lawyers or scientists. They're all these people. Um, and then there's me, <laughs> I'm kind of watering down the average, but, uh, yeah. So, um, but we got adopted and we moved to Ohio. Uh, we were in California and Kansas for some reason before we were adopted, uh, we moved to Ohio. So I'm a huge Ohio state fan. Um, <laughs> never went there, but, um, yeah, we were raised, raised in Ohio. My dad was a doctor. He actually, um, he was, he was a, he was a, to be fair, he was a fighter pilot and a flight surgeon. And when I say my dad, I mean my adopted father. I don't refer sure. to my biological parents, right? So he was right. a fighter pilot and a flight surgeon in the Air National Guard. That's how he wow. got put through medical school. He went to Texas A&M for pre-med, and then he went to Baylor for med school. Um, and uh, the Air Force Air National Guard, like, they put him through through med school. So he actually flew, and, and since he passed away when I was really young, uh, like when I was like 11, I think 11 probably, um, he actually flew F-100 Super Sabres. And wow. if people don't know what the F-100 Super Saber is, it is the precursor to the A-10. It's a precursor to the air-to-ground uh, platform, um, nice. you know, that we kind of all know and love today. And uh, what I find kind of curious is that accidentally, once again, like I chose a career <laughs> that if my dad had, had, had been alive, like we probably may, we might have had some things to talk about. Sure. Which, which is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, so... We were adopted. Uh, it was kind of a, they were still very, like they're older parents. So they were like pretty strict, <laughs> right. uh, not very forgiving. Um, so there was not really a, a compromise kind of experience as kids. Like you did it this way, period. Um, right. And if you're me, I didn't really love that. So I was like, I'll, I'll do the wrong thing anyway. I, I understand the consequence. I'm going to take it. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I, I would deliberately, um, choose my own way, understanding that it was, I was going to pay for it in the end. Sure. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that, uh, that was very helpful to anyone necessarily, but, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe taught you some lessons, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. So especially cause after like our, our dad died when I was young, um, you know, that put all the onus on my, my, my mom, my, my grandmother, right. But my mom to, to raise us and, um, I don't know if she appreciated the, the additional challenges I created. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it wasn't like I wasn't doing, I wasn't like partying or doing drugs. I was just very obstinate and would, I was like, I'm going to do this instead. Yeah. Um, and I'd, I'd take Rebellious. the punishment. Yeah. Um, so that ended up being a kind of pretentious experience uh, growing up. And um, my other brothers had their own things going on. Actually the eldest one, not that, not to totally bum the show out immediately. Like, you know, he, he committed suicide a, a while later. Um, oh, sorry to hear that, man. I appreciate that. It's, uh, but it, it ties, it'll actually weirdly tie into all this other crap that we talked about too. Right. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, so that actually is, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so that happened in my other, my middle brother and I, we don't really communicate too much. Um, so it's kind of just me now, right. My mm -hmm. mother, uh, she passed away in January, uh, from Louie body's dementia. And that will make way more sense when we get to the 17th and me going to the 174th. Um, so yeah, so that was, um, that was my childhood in a nutshell. Not a, not a great student. I was good at soccer and I could swim. Um, and I made sure I passed by just enough to play sports. <laughs> uh, that's, I, that's about all I cared about was having grades good enough to, to not be disqualified from playing sports in high school. Um, right, right. you know, and, and, uh, I, I was convinced I wasn't a super smart dude not made, not cut out for academics. Um, and, uh, it made the decision to join the military, um, which is something that I'd always wanted to do in the first place. But I actually went to the delay enlistment program to depth, like the summer before my senior year started, I was, I was in the debt program for almost 10 months before I actually went to basic training. So I, like, I actually had to take like two or three days off of, uh, the varsity soccer practice. I think my coach was like a badass patriot. And he's like, yeah, dude, <laughs> go for it. Um, he was just like, yeah, of all the reasons to get out of practice, that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, like he was he was awesome, Coach Volnick. Um, and uh, so my senior year was actually pretty chill because all my friends were freaking out about SAT scores and college exams and all. I'm like, <laughs> I don't do anything, man. It was great. Right. It was phenomenal. <laughs> uh, so my senior year was actually not bad. Um, you know, from an experience standpoint, in academics, I was still a turd. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, 
that's the academics are one of the big, big reasons I joined the military. Cause I thought I wouldn't have to go to school anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's my, that's my, that's my childhood really, you know, um, nice. like what prompted me to join the military besides, besides like being a little dummy in high school. Um, my family was extremely patriotic. Um, you know, uh, I can't rem- like, I remember the first little piece of artwork I drew for like, Sunday school, like, what's your favorite holiday? And I'm sure they wanted to say Christmas or Easter. And I was like, Fourth of July, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, yeah, so and then as kids, um, because my parents were a little bit unique, we were homeschooled for about four or five years, and that that homeschool period fell inside the Gulf War as well. Um, and my dad being a fighter pilot, and I have family going back to the Revolutionary War. Um, uh, I actually have a a great, a many greats grandfather, General Mahone, who was a general for the Confederate Army. Um, and uh, his famous battle was the Battle of the Crater, uh, which is actually a pretty wild story about Confederate soldiers like mining underneath Union soldier lines and just blowing the crap out of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, super wild. Um, so it's called the Battle of the Crater. And he actually has a, we have, I still have his gold pocket watch because after the war, he became like a senator and, uh, a railroad guy and there if you go on wikipedia and you look up general mahone um he has a a watch band in this photo and at the end of that watch band it's tucked in his pocket is the watch that i have it's a gold uh it's a gold pocket watch from paris and it's still like you can still open it and see all the all the mechanisms everything's really it's like really really nice (laughs) that's cool it's super wild um and my my actual my, my first name peyton um is on my namesake is sir peyton randolph Cause my mom is a Virginian. Like she's a Virginian, like full on, like, <laughs> and, uh, I was, I was named after uh, this dude I'm related to, which is Sir Peyton Randolph, who was the president of the first continental Congress. Wow. And so Peyton is my name. My eldest brother's name is Randolph. Okay. Uh, and like William general, William Mahone, his middle name is Randolph. Like William, it's actually William Randolph is my brother's name. So, Okay. Um, bottom line, and then my dad was a fire pilot, and the Knipples have a name on the Vietnam Memorial. Um, you know, uh, so we. Bottom line, a lot of lot of uh, patriotism in our family. We were raised that way sure. during the after the Gulf War. Dennis Horskop, he wrote a book called "It Doesn't Take a Hero," and um, my mom was. I was still homeschool at the time. My mom was getting her hair done, and she's like, "Dude, you need to like." not be a, a, a turd in this hair salon <laughs> they read this book I'm like okay it was a huge huge book yeah and uh first page of the first chapter i was like oh i want to join the military basically the first page <laughs> uh uh sports Cop describes his dad who had also gone to west point he's his dad's getting ready to go like do world war ii and his yeah. dad had his west point saber and he like and sports Cop's like seven years old and he hands this sword to seven-year-old Norman Schwarzkopf. He's like, you're the man of the family now. You have to keep us safe while I go off and do the whole war thing. And I was like, oh, that is super cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, as, as a dumb boy who doesn't know anything about anything, like, this sounds amazing. I'm like, I want to join the military, right? You know, and, uh, and, and that's kind of how it, it spiraled from there. And I, I thought I wanted to go to West Point, um, realized that that requires, like, being good at school and math things I'm not good at. So God, I'll just, yeah. I'll just do the enlisted thing. It seems easier. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, speaking of the medal of honor thing, uh, my wife, her, her maiden name is Wallen W A H L E N. So that's her, her dad's name and everything like that. Um, and there's a dude named George Wallen, her dad's uncle, my wife's uncle, my wife's great uncle, I guess. Um, and he was a Navy corpsman during the battle of Iwo Jima. Uh, and ended up like over the period of three days and saving a bunch of lives, and, like crawling 600 meters over open ground with his butt shot off and like saving another platoon's lives and all these other things. Uh, so over the course of like these three days, he was, he, he was eventually awarded the, the Medal of Honor. Uh, he, he lived for it. Right? And so he it wasn't posthumous. It was a living award. Um, and then he came back to Utah, which is where I live, where I retired to. And, um, decided he wasn't done yet, got a commission in the army reserves. And then he went to Korea and Vietnam. 
Jeez. Um, I think you got, I, I think it was the single service cross. You got a couple more purple hearts. Um, but the family didn't really know about it too much. Uh, my wife's family didn't know about it too much until Clint Eastwood did the whole like two sided uh, series, Flags of Our Fathers and, and Sam of Iwo Jima. So yeah. as Clint Eastwood was kind of researching the roles and researching the story for those movies, that's when he came across George Wallen. Um, and uh, he has a book. George Wallen has a book called The, the Quiet Hero. Really amazing story. And almost yeah. the entire Utah VA system is named after him. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so that's it, crazy. It's that's so awesome. cool, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Holy cow. Um, so, that's, <laughs> so that's like, uh, that's why I joined the military, right? Yeah. Um, and then I went to basic training and like every every kid. So I went into the recruiter's office. And this is how I joined the Air Force, by the way. I, I like golf. And my recruiter is like, oh, you like golf? I'm like, yeah, totally. And uh, he's like, let's go to Wright Patterson Air Force Base and play some free golf. I'm like, deal. I'm in Ohio. That's that's cool. Let's go. Let's go play some free golf, man. Um, and he's like, yeah. I'm like, so every Air Force base has a golf course. He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. Let's do. Let's join the Air Force. And that's how I made yeah. my decision. He's like, so what do you want to do? I'm nice. like, something, something cool. Um, so I, I he told me about PJs. He didn't know about tactics at all. Mm-hmm. Um, right. He's like PJs and combat controllers, and he said air traffic control. I'm like, oh, that sounds hard. So I'll do I'll do PJs. <laughs> I'm great in the water. Like, honestly, like I, you said, ATC sounded hard. So you're like, I'll be a PJ. Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I go to basic training, like everyone back in the two thousands open general. Cause that's how you, that's yeah. the only way you could go to those career fields. And I took the past out of, I class eight for, for indoc. I was going to go do indoc. And, um, but I also was aware that the attrition rate was 10, like 90%. Right. Um, I'm not good at math, but I can I can do at least one to ten, right? <laughs> right. Um, and I had some trepidations about that. I was like, I've not been very successful in the first eighteen years of my life. Um, I'm concerned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and then I don't know if you've talked to Mike Tuckman yet. Um, no, not yet. So he and I were in basic training together, and we we're in the same flight. And it was like one of these like late night. You should be in bed, but you're 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 not in bed, and you're talking right. Um, yeah. And they start talking about TACP. I'm like, what is this TACP thing? They're like, oh, it's this calling airstrikes for special forces. All I'm like, really? <laughs> this sounds <laughs> way cooler than being a PJ. So I walked yeah. over to the to this the Starlight Pool or I forget what it's called now. I was like, I don't want to do this. They're like, are you quitting already? I'm like, I guess. They're like, all right. And they were like, dude, they were mean. They were like, all right, leave quitter. I'm like, yeah. Oh gosh, that's brutal. <laughs> um, I haven't even done anything yet, and uh. <laughs> They were calling me a quitter. Wait, so you were in, you had finished basic and you were in like an, an OLH kind of a thing? Or no, you were no. still in basic? Or? No, I was still in basic and I'd taken the past. Oh, okay. And I still had like, a, like two weeks to finish basic training. I think oh, I was okay. ready to go to like the field or whatever for a week. And I like, I, so I had to go like tell these guys I wasn't going to be a PJ anymore. Even though right. I, not, I had not gone to Indoc, I had not done anything yet. And I went there and I was like, hey guys, I'm going to be a tech field. Like, that's dumb. Like, I'm like, so they, they, they call me a quitter. Like, all oh, I'm like, Oh gosh. Like, and then I thought about like, man, like my, my military career is not starting off well. I'm already quitting things, <laughs> you know? And then I went to, um, then, so I, you know, graduated big training with the, went to tech B school. Uh, I was a very underwhelming tech B student. Ask Ivan Rankin, ask, <laughs> ask Lee Blackwell, um, ask all those guys. I was not like a standout by any means. I'm confident that I was actually, they were t- probably taking bets on me in the field if I was in a failed vehicle nav or not. Confident. Ranger Knight is the one. Uh, no, not Ranger Knight. Uh, Ranger Kibbe. Yeah. Ranger Kibbe is the one who gave me my my land nav reeval. And I was terrified when he showed up to like the student holding area. I was like, I am so screwed. They sent this dude to murder my soul. I'm I'm washing out. <laughs> right, right? Uh, dude. He couldn't have been nicer. And I don't know if he wants me to say that or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, now it's okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's, he was like, Hey man, like you can do this. I'm like, okay. He's like, you've got two and a half hours. Like you can do this. Take the time you need. Don't rush. Do this. I was like, yeah. I remember sitting in an intersection one time, like just like, like during the, I'm like, Oh, I was the worst people now ever, ever. Um, <laughs> terrible at it. I got my license like three months before I went to, went to basic training. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know how to drive or anything. I was like, Oh, Especially dirt roads. I'm like, oh god! And they, right. they put like yeah. put like minefields um, all over the place. Like uh, Sergeant Swales was his name. He's yeah. like, dude, you just blew up. 
you just murder everyone in the Conway. I'm like, Oh God, <laughs> like I'm the worst at this. Um, <laughs> you know, it was, I was, so I was a really, other than PT or I could, I was, I went to basic training weight 130 pounds. Um, I, I left basic training weight 139 pounds cause I'd eaten so much food and it was all bad food. Yeah. So I was yeah. like, Oh God. But uh, I could PT at tacky school. That was about it, man. And I was, right. I could like study for a test. Right. Uh, but I was, I think what's re- kind of more interesting is like guys like James Spreeder were in my father flight who, I don't know if you know now, but like he's the, yep. he's the career field manager for the tacky career field. Yeah. Um, and dude. he was, he was at my first duty station at Fort Drum. Guys like uh, Jeff Mack, fourth ASOG commander now for attack P's. Um, Brandon Temple, PhD, legislative liaison, freaking right. officer Brandon Temple, former former conventional seventeenth guy. Like, like those guys were in in my TAC B flights, right? Like yeah, yeah. these really high performing, you know, ended up being these really like wild high performing dudes. Um, and yeah. I was just a really young kid, and that's that kind of what brings us to four drum. You know, like I got I got four drum, and Spreeder was there, Jeff Mack was there. Um, my first commander of note was Colonel Bo Shane. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and Pete Donnelly, I think was the DO. I forget. I mean, I know he was the DO. I don't know if he ever took command of the, of the, of the 20th. Um, I know he went on to take command of other things, but uh, he was a DO while I was there. Um, you know, but I got to Fort Drum and super motivated to be attacked, be like really proud. Cause it was like the first thing I'd ever accomplished in my life. Right. You know, besides like that was successful. Like, I wouldn't call not failing successful. I'd just like, congratulations. But like, it was sure. the first thing I had succeeded at, right. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. and, and, and despite, like, I remember seeing the jerk two six pallet and I was like, I was like, there's no way I'm going to learn anything about this thing. Like, <laughs> so I was the same I'm like there's no yeah. way I see all these cables and all these buttons. And I'm like, this, this is not what I was told. This is incorrect. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know how I'm getting like RF theory. I'm like, yeah, yeah. What are we doing now? Like, I was, <laughs> I, so, so I got to Fort Drum and I, I actually had these, it was a really, I don't want to say magical time, but it was an amazing time to be attack P from 2000 to 2006 at Fort Drum because we had like a million um, guard and active duty fighter squadrons like oh, in yeah, proximity yeah. to us. Um, and we had an amazing, we still do amazing impact range right do like it, we had a flight and b flight either flight had a week of casts every other week so like if it was a flight's turn this week b flight was doing some kind of in garrison training and then swap you had four yeah. days of casts every week and if someone didn't have a Jeez, slot awesome. on b flight i'd jump into that stuff man um as long as you got done being cmr and i got there in january and this goes back to vehicle now by the way still sh- <laughs> sorry can i cuss on this i i have a terrible yeah. mouth um, no, still bad, sure. still, still bad at vehicle now. Not like I, I got better at tech school. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I do like Sean Lloyd and, uh, Lewis Jernigan, which like some, most guys probably don't recognize those names. Sean Farrington, um, Roman Lopez, Trevor Bradford, who just retired as the, the chief master Sergeant of the PA Air National Guard. Um, I, uh, I had these really amazing dudes. Um, Billy Otter. <laughs> oh yeah, Ranger, yeah. Ranger Otter was there, man. I was, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy had a tab. Like Jason Hoover, like uh, old Steve Tadich. I don't know if you remember Steve Tadich at all. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, I was in Korea with Tad. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. It's it's crazy. Uh, he's dead, by the way. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. Right? Like, he passed away. It's yeah, so wild. Yeah. Joe Wren, Andre Bansley. Like I had all these amazing yeah, yeah. dudes um, that I was learning from, and uh, but I was just a really young tap I was really immature. Um, I did not have a thick skin at all. Like I could like Spreeder and those dudes made fun of me because they smelled blood in the water. And like, we're just going to sure. pick on this dude. I was, yeah. Like, and I, I'm sure I was, I was hard to like sometimes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm confident they'll all agree with that. I'm, we're all great friends now. Right. Um, but I'm sure I was, I was hard to tolerate sometimes because I just, all I want to do is be a good tech fee. And if I saw people screw around, I was like being serious enough. And like, I was not probably a lot of fun sometimes, you know? Yeah. But I was shown a lot of grace too. Like these guys, you know, despite me <laughs> still like, I was like, Hey man, like let's make Peyton a good tech for you anyway. But like, so I got there in January of 2001. Um, and I remember 
a night uh, where Steve Aki um, was like land navving me. I was for my CMR stuff, and I was he was like, "You got a land nav, and you got to change the fills on the radio, and set up the new net number, and do all these things." I'm like, "Dude, how can I possibly be equal nav and do all these things?" He's like, "Figure it out, man." <laughs> and then I got mad. I was like, super outburst. He's like, all right, stop, stop the Humvee. <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. Um, and it's snowy, it's for drum. It's a bit snowy in January. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was probably like February or something. I don't know. It was, it was not warm for sure. Right, right. Um, he's like, jack your feet up. So like, <laughs> I got my feet jacked up on the front of the Humvee with a map in front of my face with a red lens. And the, the the crazy ten, and he's like, "Don't ever tell me you can't do something again like that." Like if I tell you to do it, you gotta do. It. I'm just like, "Oh God!" Like, and I'm terrible at like handstand push-ups or like <laughs> like that. Yeah. I was like, "Oh, my hands are freezing cold." He's like, "Get back in the truck and figure it out." <laughs> nice. Um, and uh, you know, and 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 then when I became a tap instructor, like I was like, "Why was this so hard for me?" Like it's so simple. It's, it's, it's yeah. really uncomplicated, but I was so just nervous, um, and scared. And, um, I just want to be a good tactic. So I didn't want to make any mistakes. Sure. Um, so of course I made mistakes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. When you're trying so hard to not screw up, that's when you screw up the most. It seems yeah. like, yeah. Cause I, I wanted these guys, I wanted these guys to see me as a good tactic because I wanted to be like, cause every unit is this way. Like it's not unique to Fort Drum or unique tech piece. Like clearly have your high performers and you have your dirt bags and there's something in the middle, oh. right? I wanted to be over here with the high performers. I didn't want to be seen in the middle. I definitely didn't want to be seen over here. So I was like very sure. desperate to go that way. And, um, you know, uh, maybe worked out sometimes, maybe didn't, but like, dude, four drum was amazing. Like, uh, I think, yeah. I think the, uh, cause we also had the light fighter school right there, which is like the four drums, like pre ranger, air assault, like rappel master, all the things we had all, right, we had right. everything there. And we were literally like a block down the street from light fighter school. So we would just like walk up. Life fighters going like, hey, you got any free slots? Um, so I think within like the like my first summer after getting CMR, like you go to air assault. So me and Jeff Mack went to air assault together. <laughs> um, nice. And Jeff Mack uh, won the twelve miler. It was amazing. He was a stud. Uh, it was it's phenomenal because we're a light fighter entry unit. Um, and at the graduation, they call up the award winners for like the best student and the whatever, and then they call up the winner of the twelve mile rep march. And it's this Air Force dude. <laughs> uh, and the entire, How'd that go over? <laughs> uh, the entire Army formation got dropped for letting an Air Force guy beat him. Like, at, at the graduation. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, the Whoever was overseeing the graduation, like, dropped the entire Army graduating class <laughs> for letting an, an Air Force person beat a light infantry unit at the thing they make their money at. And it was right. awesome. It was so, – and, and Jeff, great. like, the thing was, like, so I'm, I'm short. I'm, like, 5'9". I got short little legs. And – uh Jeff hung with me for like the first six or seven miles. Um, and we had a pretty good pace, right? Yeah. Um, on that 12 miler. And then like Jeff is like nine feet tall in most of its legs. He's like, right. and he also played like college soccer and coach college soccer. He's like, Hey man, you going to make it? I'm like, yeah, dude. He's like, I'm going to go. <laughs> and like, he was <laughs> gone. Um, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, I, so I went to air assault, uh, and then, Dude, nine eleven kicked off. Like, uh, like n- I remember thinking before because uh, our NCOIC Bill Staub, um, you know, had been to Mogadishu as part of like the tenth Mountain, the element that helped recover and, and do all things. Oh, for, right, right, yeah. You know, so he was part of that. So he had a combat patch. Um, when like when combat patches meant something, in my opinion, right? Like, you know, sure, was, like they nobody were, they had were, one. Yeah. They were rare. They were significant. Yeah, I like, and I, I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, I'm, and I thought, I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm probably gonna. I probably won't see war in my entire career. You know, I, 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 I was like, thing, yeah. I was like, it'll, it'll probably take me forever. And you thought the same thing. We spent most of your career at 17 yeah. <laughs> in the war. Man. Well, like when I was younger, you know, I, I did, uh, we did four, I did like three or four years down to DM and we did, went down to Panama, Eric yeah. Harris and Keith Ingram were my mentors there. And, uh, and then I went to Korea and then I went to Germany. So I'm like, man, when's this ever going to happen? You know? And then it, one thing Eric Harris told me one time, because he had they, they were fresh out of Panama. They they were the five the the fifty eighty seventh and five hundred eighth down there, and he said 
he's i was like man you know you guys just got out of combat i'm um, when's never you know it's never gonna happen for me he's like look you stay in long enough something's gonna happen and sure enough man 9 11 kicked off and we were busy uh, ever since so yeah you know uh but uh yeah so i remember thinking i'm gonna, never gonna go to war i'm just gonna train for right. challenge forever <laughs> um yeah exactly you know, right like like uh like brian wachensky like you know just lightning challenge ninjas um right you know it was fun i mean that part that part was pretty fun i mean but it wasn't like it felt like you were just kind of spinning your wheels like you just kept training and training and training for it almost seemed like you're training for nothing yeah and it, that, you know, that whole like yeah. back in the day like stumped a dummy like you know biz yeah, thing, yeah. which is still important like and steve aki i think could probably still biz anyone into the freaking ground um that right. dude was a, a monster at it but uh also an amazing JTAC, but still. Sure, um, sure. So then, uh, obviously, nine eleven kicked off, and uh, I don't know why, but it was like everyone who saw go to Afghanistan and the tenth Mountain Division. <laughs> you know, like it was such a. And I, I know like Hunter First went too, um, and but if you've been to tenth Mountain Division, everyone knows that like there are no mountains at Fort Bragg. Right. <laughs> there are zero mountains. Right. You have to drive like an hour, best case scenario, in any direction to see a peak of anything <laughs> right right you know like uh but but that also goes back to the 10 that was like awesome legacy being formed by like professional skiers and and alpinists uh in world war ii to go wage the the northern Italy campaign which is a really cool story by itself um actually here yeah. in utah um if you drive into park city there's actually 10th mountain highway which is really cool oh, because okay. they, did, they did a lot of their training between like here in colorado um Huh. So Ted Mountain like actually got a lot of the conception in the in this area because of the terrain. Um, so hence Ted Mountain, obviously, but I didn't know why. But uh, Ted Mountain got picked to go. Um, yeah, and I was I was not initially I was not picked initially um, when they like oh I'm like these guys are going. I thought I had been though. I remember showing up the shop on a Saturday, thinking I was helping get the vehicles ready. And they're like, "What are you doing here, man?" I'm like. I'm here, here to go to war, guys. Like we're, we're going to war. Yeah. You're like, no, you're not on this lift, dude. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? That's how also arrogant I was. I was yeah. like, I was like, oh, of course I'm the one going. It's a flight, <laughs> and I'm the best one in a flight. Why wouldn't I be picked? Um, yeah. Such an idiot. Um, I don't know how it happened, but I did end up actually getting picked to go <laughs> because oh, really? I made a made a big enough pain in my ass to everyone. Like they're like, I oh, just bring him. Um, yeah, you showed so, up, you're motivated, and they're like, hey, maybe, you know, I have no idea that's all it I, takes. I know, I have no idea how I got on that trip. Uh, and um, and then, uh, so December 3rd, uh, I remember that because my, my eldest brother's birthday, um, we were loaded up on a C5. I've never seen a C5 in my life. Um, but Fort Drum has an airfield that I think is qualified to land the space shuttle. It's like one of those airfields that's around the, the country that can, like, take a space shuttle, I think. It's something, it's uh-huh. huge. Um, yeah. so, you know, we're over at, uh, I think it's Wheeler Sack and we're just in the, in the December 3rd, it's snowing. We're loading up our, our Humvees. Um, <laughs> I'm like, cool, man, let's do this. I was pretty excited. You know, uh, when we get, we fly into K2, Karchi Kanabad, Can- Can- K2, Uzbekistan. Yeah. Um, and C5 is doing a combat descent into a completely blacked out airfield. Yeah. Um, and it's actually really cool that you had Stinky on last episode, yeah. Because that, that's where I met him and Larry Parton was in K two. They just they just gotten back from getting after it. Oh, cool! So wild, right? Like because they were still yeah. like coming in and out of K two as a staging base, right? And right. Um, you had your like little Camp Alpha soft camp compound, which is like barbed wire and like don't come in here, <laughs> like versus what yeah. it like ended up being it was like super. And it was like it was winter, obviously, and it was uh, it was just muddy and sloppy. Um, it was just a weird place, man. Um, yeah. it's when red, I weirdly, I remember that's when Red Bull started coming out because like the weird little like shoe box of a, a shop at had flats of Red Bull. I didn't know what they were. I'm like, those look cool. I just bought <laughs> some flats of Red Bull, man. Uh, and brought them back to the, the tents and, uh, you know, we still didn't have fuel. Um, so like we had to get the vehicles ready to go. And we actually ran out of gas Oh no! Um, on the, on K2. And so we were just like following this fuel truck around trying to get gas from this, like this, this POL truck. And that's when I learned how to like, you had to bleed fuel. I never had to bleed a fuel line in a Humvee before. Right. Cause oh, yeah, I've never done got, that. Yeah. yeah. There's this weird little like flip that like opens up 
like the tube to let the air out. Oh, okay. Otherwise, it like gets bubbles in it and it doesn't work. And all of a sudden, like uh, Steve Aki and Joe Renner, like, what, you guys never blood a fuel in? I'm like, no, dude. Me and this guy yeah. named Ron Evia. Me and this guy named Ron, this, this big Filipino dude named Ron Evia. Um, I'm like, no, man. <laughs> so we learned how to like bleed fuel lines. Um, so the K2 thing was interesting because there was uh, another guy there named Vic McCabe. Do not love me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Colonel Beauchene had deployed early because he was like running all the air for the war right there at K2, yeah, yeah. essentially. Um, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'd had, I had a girlfriend, uh, you know, like I'm a 19 year old kid. I think I was just 20, actually. And she ended up like having some trouble back in, back in Watertown. <laughs> and I brought it up. And Vic's like, well, you're you're just not suited to like you're emotionally not ready to be here now because your girlfriend's. And I was like, what are you talking about, dude? What? So he sent me home. Um, and uh, I was pretty I was pretty upset about that because yeah, I got sure. like I'm like this is not a wife, this is not anything. Um, why am I getting sent home from like the coolest thing ever? Yeah, right. Like this is all I want to do. I was furious with this guy. Um, so like, uh, my, my first deployment was just like a TDY really. Like it wasn't, it wasn't anything. Um, and I got back like, I think it was January or something like that. Like end of, end of, end of Christmas or early January, I don't know, something weird. Um, and of course me and that girl, like we break up, right? Like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> like it was like, oh, whatever, man. Um, yeah. but it was so, so ridiculous. And then, yeah, um, it seems odd. It was really odd. Um, uh, really disappointed with that. Um, because what ended up happening was I missed almost all of, op- <laughs> I ended up redeploying in like February, March of 2002 when I'd already been over there. Yeah. Um, and I, we, me and Trevor Bradford, and a few guys like roll into country and like we ended up, our, our first mission ends up being like the tail end of Operation Anaconda after Aki and Ren and Lloyd and Farrington and all those guys had pulled out. Uh, we went and like did like the cleanup of end of, end, end of Operation Akana and rolled into this thing called Polar Harpoon. Okay. Um, and uh, it like one of the there were some low performers on the team that I had left, and if I'd been there, I think I would have been just fine. But because yeah. I got sent home, there was just some weirdness. Uh from some of the, some of the young tech they didn't, they didn't stay in very long after that. Um, you know, uh, and I'm just, I'm still to this day, I'm like, it's such a weird thing. But so we, yeah. we roll into, um, this kind of cleanup of operation and conduct into, into polar harpoon. Uh, my first mission, my, my entire life, I've got a Blackhawk Raptor pack. Cause also <laughs> there's this really this big sign of immaturity on my part where like, I wanted to stand up. I'm like I'm attack P. I'm better than you, yeah. and like, and if you go to the 17th now, like if you go way not, and when you go back to get into my 17th, we're like I didn't want to stand out at all. I just wanted to be part of the team. Sure. So there's this really different um, kind of set of behaviors. So I was like, I had my Raptor pack, and I didn't have a rucksack, and I thought it was too cool. I had like, I had 110 pounds in a black off book bag, essentially. Jeez. Idiots, idiots, and I weighed 130 pounds. It was a yeah. little dummy, right? <laughs> so we go. And I, in like, uh, maybe I knew that we were going to Roberts Ridge, but maybe I don't know if I, if I knew for sure. I can't, uh-huh. I can't remember if I'm like, oh yeah, because like basically what 10th Mountain was tasked to do at the end of Anaconda and, and through Polar Harpoon, um, was to reestablish our position in the Shycott Valley, uh, take to Kurgar Mountain, Roberts Ridge mm-hmm. and clean up anything that was left over. Okay. So my element uh, was tasked to take Robert's Ridge again. <laughs> so we're all these 160th Chinooks. I'm like, this is great. This is so cool. Um, yeah. We're all packed in there. We've got mortars and we got, we got everything. We got, we got a fighting force. We're like ready right. to go get after it. Um, I don't know if I was nervous or scared. I don't, I don't remember anything, right? From like how right. I felt. Um, but, uh, we did a lift landing. So like the back wheels 
because we're so high up in elevation. We had so many people on the aircraft. Like the back wheels are like on the mountain and the front is hanging off. Um, and they dropped the ramp and it's just snow. <laughs> just snow and like steep mountain. They're like, get off the helicopter. They're like, got it. So I slide my butt off the helicopter. You still have to like jump. I land in like knee deep snow. Um, I get like, I get snow in my, my muzzle, my, my weapon. I'm like, Oh God, now I'm going to blow my, my barrel off. <laughs> right. <laughs> like that's how dumb I am. And then, uh, so they had skid codes and mortars. <clears throat> so everyone knows skid code is basically like a, a, a plastic toboggan. Right. They slip that thing off the ramp. It hits the snow. It is gone. Oh like, no. <laughs> mortar rounds are like, just like gray. They're still in like the, the mortar round casing. Right. Um, yeah. the, the, the carrying the tube or whatever it is, they're just like flipping <laughs> down the mountain. Oh um, my God. but because those are our only, you know, organic fire support, uh, you know, outside of a weapon system, yeah. you had Joe was just humping like army 10 mountain guys, just collecting 81 millimeter mortar rounds that had cartwheeled down the freaking mountain. And we're already like 11,000 feet. No one had been in altitude. Um, dudes are sucking. Um, yeah. Like it was terrible. And like we get off and like we took like some, there was like this weird little black tent over there. Um, we took some, and my, my JTAC, because I was still, or my ETAC, I was still a Romad, right? Um, mm-hmm. my, my, my ETAC was on another flight. We was on another aircraft. So they're like one of us, like the whole like cross load so you don't lose all your assets. Sure, or sure. Yet, right? He hadn't landed yeah. yet. Um, and so little some pop shots or whatever, uh, some ineffective stuff. And we tell us from from this place. And we had some AH-1 Super Cobras. Um, and the army was like, the Air Force, kill that thing. I'm like, and I was still like, can I do that? <laughs> Am I allowed to do this? And I'm like, yeah, it's called fire. It's probably cool. Um, but uh, I, I want to make sure there are no friendlies around. I, I, I did some over, I did a little more due diligence, due diligence than I probably needed to. Sure. <laughs> First round. Yeah, of- I mean, you, you want to make sure you're like, doing it right. Super nervous because we also had dudes down the valley because, like, we were up on the mountain. They were down this kind of like this this valley here, um, on the backside of the, the Roberts Ridge. I was like, oh man, I don't, I, I got to be really careful about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I remember just laying on my back and these probers coming in and just smoking the crap out of this thing, and I was like, oh, this is combat, hooray! You know, That's awesome. I, yeah. I was doing it, you know, and I, I did it okay. <laughs> it was cool. Um, and I, and I remember too, man, cause I had like the, the 117, uh, the 117 Fox, like the, the original one, right? right? Um, like pulling out the SACCOM antenna and like just going through my steps in my head, like this checklist of things I have to do. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I think because I was so caught up in my checklist, I didn't really think about what, what was happening around me. So I didn't really, wasn't really bothered by it initially. Um, sure. and, uh, the army had never seen a 117 before. So I had just like the little KDU, right? The faceplate. Right, and it was, right, right. you know, and they're like, is that your radio? And they thought the faceplate was the radio. I was like, <laughs> I'm like, no, man. It's, it's, awesome. my, it's, my, it's my remote KDU. And they're like, what, what is this? Because they saw Spitfires. They had like ASIPs. They were trying to set up an OE254 like this, like on the mountain. It was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was crazy. Uh, yeah. But it was, it was a really <laughs> – um, and then we had like, okay, cool. That thing's done. Uh, dude, and I didn't, I didn't do a end fire mission. So the Cobras just kept on getting after it. They just started lighting things up. They thought we're, they're like, ah, oh, this looks cool. We're going to shoot this too. I'm like, yeah, you know, like, uh, it was, it was awful. <laughs> um, so, but I, I was on my back and the, the, the brass and the casings were like just falling out of the Cobra. I was like, this is awesome. Right. Yeah. And then we start walking up. We were about a thousand feet below the ridge about, uh, of the top of, of, uh, Robert's Ridge. Yeah. And, uh, I did not realize what altitude was. And I was like, Oh my goodness, this is terrible. Yeah. I was, this was the worst. I'm like, I like, I'm like, I'm going to die on this mountain because I'm so out of shape. <laughs> um, and then this dude snapped his leg. This army guy snapped his leg. Oh my um, God. it was wild. Uh, so he got dust off out of there and like in the melee of getting that dude on the helicopter, one of the guys was helping get him on the, on the dust off. They actually grabbed his rucksack and they left the injured guy's rucksack. So the dude ended up with the injured guy's rucksack had a pillow in it, uh, Vienna sausages, some fruit cups. Like it was ridiculous. Like he was just like he was just doing like a like a, a problem, like a field problem at Fort Drum. Like he was just like packing out. I'm like, and I had like four 
batteries, handsets. Like I was like, what in the hell is going on here? Like this, I'm like, this is, it was, it was, it was uh, interesting. Um, so sure. we, get to, we get to the top of the mountain, right? We get to the top of Robert Fridge. Like my, the first night I, I slept in combat was next to the Chinook that carried Chapman and everyone, um, or not, yeah, and that went down. Like that's my first night yeah. in combat. Like wow. I got to like walk Ro- Robert's Ridge, like post all the things, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the tr- the trenches, the the comm structure, like the 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 caches of just like rounds and RPGs that they had all over the place on that mountain. That it, like, and it'd be crazy. It wasn't like, man, um, like this dude. Like I, I mean, I've never seen like a real dead body before, right? Yeah. I mean, like I I I kicked this. I thought it was a little animal, a little fur thing. I was like, "Why is this animal up here so high? Why is it moving?" I kicked it. It's top of a guy's head. Oh my god! <laughs> um, I was like, "Whoa, dude!" Um, and it was, it was. Uh, I think it's like you always remember your first, right? Like I remember my sure. first mission. Um, and and uh, it was, it was so fascinating to see that place, um, yeah. and understand what had happened there. Um, you know, so. That was, that was, I mean, other guys have had way cooler first missions than mine. Mine is cool because of the location. If you'd said like sure. dirt hole somewhere else, like who cares, right? Mine, right. mine was cool because of the location, to be perfectly honest with you. Like it wasn't like super extraordinary. It was just uh, for that to be my first mission was really, really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, and I remember my last mission too, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ever as attack B. So um, yeah, so I did uh, that trip, went back to the States. Um, they everyone started getting spun up for for Iraq, and I was in JTAC upgrade. So uh, that summer, um, I went to airborne school. I went to EMT school. Weirdly enough, uh, yeah, oh yeah, I read that. I'm like, <laughs> how long did that take? A month. Like you just okay. in class for a month, and you study, and you, you got your EMTB, which like I didn't do shit with it. Um, <laughs> right. Like I wasn't like the I wasn't like the twenty ASOS medic at that point. Like it was just like sure, sure. cool, man. Go to EMT school. I uh, went to this yeah. thing called Mountain Leaders Close Combat Certification Course, which is basically just CQB class, uh, okay. and like learn how to do like water impulse, you know, breach charges and and doing some deck cord stuff. It was really oh, freaking cool. cool, man. Like sim rounds and all the things. It was awesome. Uh, nice. JTAC QC for six weeks, and in Vegas, the the whole month before my twenty first birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so I I I had I had less fun than other guys did. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, some, but some guys had a lot of fun where they like passed out and like flooded their hotel rooms because they like passed out in the tub. <laughs> so yes. I, I, some guys had a lot of fun, and you know, um, so I went to JTAC UC uh, that summer and uh, got my got my eval. Guys like Roman Lopez. Uh, we had an ALO. Uh, her name is uh, Deanna Violet Pinball. Um, she was amazing. Like yeah. I, I haven't worked for a lot of a lot of women in my career. But as an ALO, as a, as a, as a JTAC, brilliant, right? So it was uh, Jason Hoover, Roman Lopez. Um, Roman Lopez was a TAC P uh, for about six years. Then he stayed in upstate New York because his wife's a physical therapist. He's like one of my best friends. He en- ended up going to be the Air National Guard at the 174th um, and became an Intel uh, commissioned officer at a PAF. Um, oh, okay. But like, so Tadich, Hoover, uh, Pinball, uh, Dan, Dan is call sign. Um, and you know, Lopez all trained me up to be a JTAC. And then I deployed back to Afghanistan in 2003. Um, Bear Couch was a really interesting place. Like, so we, me and a guy named Brian Schieffer, uh, who a lot of guys probably know, he, he got paralyzed, um, at NTC, uh, back in like 2008, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I met him a um, couple times. Yeah. So he and I are like, he's also like one of my best friends. Um, we Great actually dude. deployed dude, amazing dude, like exceptional dude. Uh, we deployed Advon for 10th Mountain, so we were actually we were actually with the 82nd because that's who 10th Mountain was ripping out um, for about a month. And we got me and Brian got sent to Bear Count, okay. which is way up north past Abad. Like we were like like it was our fob, the river, Pakistan, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and about 80 miles north of us was China. Yeah, yeah. yeah super weird um yeah. and like uh it, and honestly like i've still got i can still find it on a map uh it was exactly like cop keating and like the whole like restrepo thing we were in this mm-hmm. like pocket it was just peaks 
looking down on us all the time. Um, and uh, it was, it was the, it was a really, a really interesting, we had a, we had a, we had an OGA there doing OGA things. Um, it was fascinating. Um, and uh, we actually went on a, a mission to find stingers with those guys. They, they, they needed a, a DOD asset. And like, yeah. we were the DOD asset, right? Like they had their own, they had their, they had their little partner for us, their, their Tejas or whatever you want to call them now. Um, right. And, uh, and, uh, we, we went way up in the mountains. Like we were pushing our Hiluxes up, up these roads at some points. Jeez. Um, it was ridiculous. And we get to this place. And it's actually one of the, the partner for us. It's his family's compounds up in this mountain. Um, and it's like built into like the crotch of this, this ravine, this thing going up like this, this really steep kind of terrain feature. This house was like yeah. three stories and it was kind of built back into this thing. And then the village kind of like flattened out behind. Um, yeah. But like the main, the main floor, the open area, like yeah, like grape vines growing up. It like, you could just like pick grape grapes off the grapevine. Um, really? Like we walked in like to the top floor, we had a five course meal. Like we had like all of like, like while the OGA dudes were like doing their fact find stuff, we had a five course meal. And like all of a sudden out of nowhere in this like completely remote, village in afghanistan north like way north of ice cold two liters of pepsis and yeah we, we've gotten them all over the place in afghanistan sure but like not what i expected to see in this completely rural like super like austere environment yeah and yeah. then uh you know that was just like uh and then we did another part of the meeting where like we walked through this this like this marijuana field and to this uh basically this this outdoor meeting area that was like covered by trees that had like trimmed grass like slate benches all the way around it we were at the the origination point of a of a a live spring okay. you see the water has come up out of the ground and it was like wow perfect water like you just like dip your cup in and drink water out of this thing while they were like it was like one of the once again like one of the nothing happened like there was no combat it was nothing like like it was just an amazing experience that you did not expect Afghanistan. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and the funny part was is, that guy. That guy had to be like like some sort of warlord or something in that area. He probably was loaded with money. So, uh, I mean, I can't verify his statement, but like he pointed to this this kind of like burnout spot on this mountain. Um, he's like, yeah, the the Russians were bombing up there back in the day. So this dude had been fighting the Russians. And he's yeah. like, he's like, just over there, in this little thing where we buried a bunch of dead Russians. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Can we be friends? Like, I was, like, oh, was going to say, yeah, is that a threat to us? Or is, is like, it just oh, like, God. just saying, like, you know, like, no, he was super cool. He's like, weirdly my, he was weirdly my bodyguard. He wouldn't, wouldn't let me do anything unsafe. Like if I was like sitting nice. on like the edge of the truck, he's like, no dude, you're sitting over here. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like he was like, it was for some reason that guy was like my like weird bodyguard person. Yeah. But, uh, like, so I can't verify his statement obviously, but like, curious to say the least and i don't i don't yeah, say sure. i don't i don't have a reason to doubt it honestly sure yeah <laughs> so um you know we did that and like the funny thing is maybe not funny not, funny for us maybe not funny for the guys but we got ripped out by uh two other 10th mountain guys when 10th mountain actually took over bear cow mm -hmm. next night the night after we left the place got lit up really yeah like we missed it like uh, one attack he's like completely shredded his, his ACL like had to get like because they were like rushing up the mountain to like do the thing and he like completely blew out his knee and all this other stuff Jeez. and like so like it was so crazy like we get back to, to Bagram and they're like oh yeah like Bear Cow's under attack right now <laughs> like what oh my god um, it actually makes sense because like if you have a new force ripping in like it's a pretty vulnerable time right like sure they didn't so like, but I was like, um, oh. I, mean, I was like, oh, we missed it. We missed the fight. You know, like I just wanted to be a JTAC and get after it. Um, but I'm not bummed out, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it was in a, it was in a super ideal environment. Um, and oh no, yeah. I mean, you can't. That's the kind of thing. It's like we talk about that situation all the time, where you know, right place, right time. It's just you never. You you always feel like you missed something, but then it could have gone bad. You could have got the, been the guy that blown out his ACL yeah. or got shot or whatever. So. Yeah, you just got to like, you have to just perform when it's your time and then kind of don't hope for anything else. I <laughs> kind of seems yeah. weird, but it yeah. does. And like, I remember like even getting there as a, as a young kid, 
I was like, how is this place a place? Well, why did we pick this place? <laughs> this seems like a yeah. bad idea. Um, yeah. You know, and then, so I was in Afghanistan basically nine or 10 months of, of all 2003, really. And I think it trickled, it trickled over to 2004. Um, you know, like that's when like Organi e and Shkin were like super sexy places to be, um, you know, and uh, when we were at Organi, e, me and Brian got in a mortar attack. Uh, and this is like one of those humorous stories, right? Like we all, not mortar attack, but a rocket attack at 107, right? And um we were never going to find who shot it. They were just set up on timers. So these are long gone, right? Yeah. Um, but do they like place these things inside the fob like really well? And me and I'd never seen Godfather. Uh, me and Brian like had some Haji CDs and like we were watching all the trilogy. Um, and there's this big tower at Organi. E. You know, our job was to run up the tower and like see what we could do, which is nothing. Right. It's um, super exposed. Like, why wouldn't you aim at the tower? It's the most obvious portion of the base besides the airfield. With the helicopters, <laughs> um, you know, so like our job is to run up that tower, and um, like while we're running up there, like we're taking like really good, really accurate one hundred seven fire. Like the whole, the whole obviously the the, the fob was Hesco buried up, and there was this kid who was running because they had like DFPs and in, in Hesco bearers too, mm-hmm. and there was a Hilux parked um, outside the the DFP. So he like he dives in, rocket lands, Hilux gone. Jeez. he's fine uh we are going up uh the tower as we're like going up the floor rocket lands like shreds where we just were in the like the floor of the tower like like the series of staircases um man you know uh dude everyone knows like how crappy a 107 sounds like the louder it is like you know the worse it's about to be <laughs> <laughs> right. so um and it's our tower and there's like the, the hard instructor, which is uh, like the talk and all the things. Right. And, mm-hmm. but the, the chow hall is like the wall closest to us and mm-hmm. a rocket lands and like smacks the chow hall, just like outside smacks, like the wall, of the chow hall. And I'm, and this is like the part where the Godfather makes sense because like me and, you know, Brian, like there's some sandbags up there. We wouldn't have done anything by the way. Cause like one, one, one of seven took out a whole head, like a Hesco bear was there and that was like not there. Like took out one, oh one whole one of seven. So like yeah. those sandbags are, I mean, it's like a wet paper bag, especially right. as far as the, <laughs> how effective it was going to, it was going to be though. Brian, and I get down and I just look at him like, dude, we forgot to pause the Godfather. <laughs> He's like, no man, I got it. Like it's paused. <laughs> and like of it's all the awesome. things I should be thinking about, like, I'm like, oh man, we didn't pause the movie. And then sure <laughs> enough, like the rock attacks over and like we go back and, Godfather pause. You didn't miss a back. beat. Yeah. <laughs> didn't miss a beat. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, we did a convoy from Oregon to Shkin, which is a really crappy back then, really crappy, yeah. just like, just you're going through wadis and one lane things. And the whole company was convoying to Shkin. Um, and we were meeting up with uh, the, the the company out of Shkin. Like, we're going to meet like kind of in the middle to do like a bigger action. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like my first, like, well, like I did the thing in, in at a uh, at Tukurgar and Robert Strange, like this is like my first like real combat. Like we're like you're like you know like people are shooting at people and it's not great, um, you know. Uh, so that was that was cool. It was exciting. But as we were driving back, um, they uh, we were in this deuce and a half because we didn't have our own Humvee there yet. So we had just a uh, like a, a like a, a logistics driver, right? Like a yeah. you know hadn't brought his nods and it was like nighttime. It was like full on like nighttime dude. So me and Brian, which is sort of ironic and also not funny, like, cause of what happened to him later driving off a cliff at NCC. Um, oh, yeah. like we're in this deuce and a half, like we have our nods on dry, like doing like a little more left, a little more right for the driver who couldn't see. Shit. Um, and like he almost drives us off a freaking cliff. Um, and then, we pull like we're like you can kind of see the fire we can kind of see fo- the fob organy we get completely detached from the convoy because he can't drive fast enough okay. so like we had to like hey like you guys didn't come, like we had to turn our lights on and so people come back and find it so we had no fbcb2 blue force tracker like we're like uh like it was ridiculous i was like we were gonna Jeez. get freaking rolled up right now by whatever like yeah it was it was so dumb super like, dangerous it, yeah, and the weirdest thing was, um, 
then I went to, I, I, I did my time at Oregon E, then I went to Skin, and we went on, like, and dude, we did patrols at Skin, like, two to three times a day. Like, we were, like, patrolling. Like, we got missions in, dude. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, we went on a, a foot patrol one time, and the whole freaking platoon didn't bring their, bring their nods. Me and Brian, once again, had our nods. <laughs> and, like, we're, like, we're, I don't like, even get that. I don't understand it. Like, especially now, yeah, like, being 17, sense. especially being 17, we're, like, you always, like, and I think now everyone does it. Uh, yeah, yeah, like you never don't have your knots. <laughs> well, that was the lesson from Mogadishu. I mean, we right. mentioned Mogadishu before. That was the whole lesson that everybody learned from that. You know, that yeah. was like. So we're we're walking back and like in the dark from this patrol, and like everyone knows, Skin is like right on the Paki border as well. And you have like this little swath of like Waziristan too. That's like a non-place, but it's a place. Um, yeah, yeah. And it took too long, so like everyone's in the dark, just like fumble screwing around trying to get back like all this <laughs> terrain and crap and uh me and brian are like what is happening right now yeah that's crazy um but uh you know and then um it's this is when i got my first this is when i did my first job as a jtac really um yeah. Mang- mangerte valley which is because like skin is so easy it's like that way is east everything is north and south and like behind me is west we don't go west so like it's pretty much Super simple, right? Um, sure. From a direction standpoint, um, and uh, we were like top two poles nights of my life. Like we did the patrol; it was December, um, and uh, pretty ineffective. Pretty like nothing exciting the first day, you know. Like we yeah. and we decided to bivouac in the only place in this wadi where like no sun ever gets, and it's full of snow. <laughs> Jeez, and completely indefensible. Um, so I'm just like, I got my, my, my foam pad and my sleeping bag. And like, we had to like wear all our kit to bed because when the French and Indians attack and all the things, <laughs> right. Right. Um, I had like ice in my sleeping bag. People were like cold weather injury, like puking all night long. You could just hear me yakking. Oh, it's the worst. Absolutely yeah. frozen. Like it was like, I, I did not love this, miserable. this night. This is miserable. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, we, so daytime comes, sun, sun's out. Like people were like holding their hands by the exhaust and like trying to like get into some speck of sun to warm up. I was like, dude, if we get if we get attacked right now, we are screwed because like, yeah, like I I'm useless currently. What do you know? We got attacked. <laughs> Jeez. So we get attacked from like both sides of this uh, this wadi, and I remember my my turp who just had like loafers and like business socks, like real thin socks on. It's freezing cold. I remember him just like diving under the truck. <laughs> um and i'm like what the hell i'm like um i do I, I just i just remember this so we're in this gunfight like we're like in a significant ambush like we got like we're lobbing 60s like we had some 60s fall short actually it was kind of gnarly um and we're like trying to figure out where like the, the like where i can do some some casts like what's the thing that i need to focus on right and my my fso he's a little lieutenant dude he's stoked He's just like getting it on. He's just gunning up. <laughs> and uh, do we had Sergeant Major Watson? Um, Sergeant Major Watson was in the mo- he ran the Mogadishu Mile. Oh, okay. Um, he wow. was, and he always had camo net on his helmet. And he's the only Sergeant Major in the Army that's ever liked my sideburns. The only one. <laughs> Every other Sergeant Major was like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, Air Force, <laughs> nice, nice sideburns. I'm like, sweet. Great. <laughs> Um, so my little FSO is just banging away, right? Just crushing it. And the Sergeant Major comes up. He's like, LT, super calm, super mellow. Like, what, are you, what are you shooting at? He's like, I'm just shooting where everyone else is shooting, Sergeant Major. Mm-hmm. He's like, how about you make sure you know what you're shooting at before we start shooting? All right. And Lieutenant's like, Roger. And then Sergeant Major Watson turns around, walks away, and just shouts recon as loud as he can. And disappears. What? It was the weirdest. It was. It was like I, I like I couldn't believe it. Right. <laughs> it was so. It was like I was like we're getting like basically like KD range like corrections from the sergeant major to the lieutenant in an ambush, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? And uh, it was just funny, right? Yeah. And he just with his little net on his head, he was like sh- walks away, shouts recon. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it was, uh, but then my company commander, he like, he like, we're in this wadi, he hauls ass across the wadi. And I had like ridiculous hair. 
I had a lot, I had a lot of dark hair. Um, and uh, my, my call sign back then was Frodo because I'm not very tall. Like I was long, young looking, like I just a ton of hair all out of the place. Yeah. And they call me Frodo from Lord of the Rings. Um, right. It's kind of funny. And uh, I hear Captain Pelkey, my company commander, he's like, shouts like, he's like, Frodo, get your ass over here. I'm like, all right. And I got a romad. His name's John Barber. Awesome dude. Super awesome dude. And uh, we run across the Wadi. I've got like my map, and my weapon, and my my Garmin E-Trex Vista, or whatever it is back in the day. Right. I think it was amazing. Um, yeah. And we're running across the Wadi. And of course, I bust my ass and fall down on my face. <laughs> so you got little like like little things popping around me. And uh, and John, and his, his call sign was Boo Boo because he sounded like uh, Boo Boo from um, or Jellystone or that uh, the cartoon of the bear. Yeah, you'll be very. He's like very droll. He's like, I don't know. Like, he's very droll. His delivery is like yeah. super, like underwhelming. And he's like, he's like just there, like picking my ass up out of this wadi. Like, come on, man. <laughs> like, you, you guess my sh me. And like, we get to the other side of the wadi. By that time, I, I figured out what I needed to do. Um, ended up doing like danger close with some GB twelves. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was super cool. I was like, oh, dude, it's happening. We're doing this. <laughs> And uh, I was stoked. Uh, I didn't shoot my gun once. I was just, it was I didn't need to. I was doing cap. Right, right. right. Um, that's why I have a whole company of infantry guys to do that for. And um, and then uh, they checked off because they, they have the, they had the bladder of like a two year old, and they got to go get some more gas. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then a tens and Apache checked on. Nice. And um, we got some bad guys uh, that we picked up, and I basically did a hasty hasty jab uh, with those dudes. And it was a cool day, man. Like so, that was like my first first day in combat. That's like awesome. first, like first, first cast that I've done, um, and it was freaking sweet. Yeah, um, I was I was pretty proud of myself because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it, it worked, right? Like yeah. it, it worked. Uh, and then you know, it kind of goes back to the credibility stuff. Like, um, my my company trusted me to do my job. Yeah, you know, they they wanted me there. Um, and then like some silly stuff, like. I said, uh, went out and did an ambush one night, and Shkin was out of like everything. All we had was frappuccinos from Starbucks. Oh, yeah. Really like the, really like the glass. And, like, and I thought, like, this is delicious, wonderful. <laughs> right. And then we got flu shots, flu shots the same day. We're going to an ambush, cold shit at night. And I am like, I, I told my PL, I'm like, hey, man, if I don't make a number two over here uh we're gonna have some problems yeah <laughs> he's like well i'm like i'm currently sick and i'm sick in my stomach so in the middle of the ambush i got well not we weren't in the ambush like yeah. we were like set up you're on the line yeah right like you're on the line like i'm i'm back off the line like in a juniper bush <laughs> like heaving my soul out like hoping that we don't initiate the ambush right now um because he's Frappuccinos. Right. And I've honestly, I don't. I maybe I've had like one or two frappuccinos in my life since then. Yeah. Um, in a bad experience. It was so, it was so ridiculous. <laughs> um, but uh, like, what? It's a, it, was, it was just, it was just weird, silly stuff like that. Like, yeah. uh, you know, that was that was the mission. And then, um, you know, came back from that and did some more tactics. Just like, you know, I went to lightning challenge, um, <laughs> and then PCS to Alaska. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, How'd you end up in Alaska, by the way? I'm curious. Uh, I was stationed up here. I, I was at Red Flag as an active duty guy for from. Uh, matter of fact, I was looking at the timeline. I think we just missed each other because you said you left in 09. I got up here in March of 09 and stayed till 12. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we we must have just missed each other. I think so. Yeah. Um, and where'd you leave from? Uh, Benning. Okay. Yeah, I got non involved yeah. up here from uh, from Fort Benning because I've been there for 11 years. So somebody was like, "Yeah, he needs to go do something else." <laughs> Been there doing like the the thing, man. Like, yeah, I mean, cool it, stuff. yeah, we were getting after it. I mean, it was I, I felt justified staying there, but yeah, somebody else didn't. So, <laughs> yeah, um, it happens, right? Sure. So I got to Iraq. Iraq was really interesting. This is where we got to start get the low points, right? Uh, okay, we, we we talked about some low points. Um, that was stoked doing Alaska. Thrilled. Couldn't couldn't have been happier. So excited. Yeah. Um, got there and basically a few months later, went straight to right, straight to Missoula. Um. I'd never done urban stuff. I'd only been to Afghanistan. Um, urban was completely new to me. It's not something we'd ever trained. Yeah. Like other than a mouth site, like, oh, let's shoot some smoky Sams. And like, like we hadn't really trained urban cats. Right, right. 
um, like how confusing it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, so my first mission, because uh, I was actually at QR West, Q West to South Missoula for like a month um, before I went back up to Missoula because they're like, it was like, there was nothing, it was, it was pointless. They needed us in Missoula, not QR West. Um, and uh, my first mission, strike it. Um, we go out, we go to this place where we're supposed to meet whoever. We start, and I still don't know. I don't know where the hell I am, man. There's like 18 bridges in Missoula. There's like everything. There's a million routes. Like right. it's just ridiculous, right? Um, and we start taking mortar fire again, like just on our um, on our like nothing hit our strikers, but like, dude, like our dock was in the striker, and all of a sudden, like, because our ramp is buttoned up, like you're like thumping on the ramp, and the platoon sergeant taking shot with the ass, and um, like. We got him in, our doc was patching him up and like, we, we're getting the hell out of here, right? So we start, I didn't realize how fast strikers could go. I didn't know how mobile they were. They could just basically roll over anything. Yeah. Um, they're like, Peyton, like get cast. I'm like, <laughs> so I was super ineffective, like trying to get them just to provide like convoy security for us. Mm-hmm. Cause I, we were going so fast, like in like my trying to understand the map and like what we we're doing. It wasn't great, man. Yeah. It wasn't solid. So I ended up, because you had, you had a whole route map of Missoula. I ended up like, I, I memorized by drawing every, like I could draw Missoula via route, all of them, every single one of them, nice. all the colors, all the vehicle names, all the things. So it got to the point, because that was so bad, where like I could be in the striker, not looking at anything, and just based off the turn, know where we were at. Wow. Um, That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, because uh, I was like, it was, oof, it was not good, dude. Um, I was, it was hard. It was hard. I didn't know another way to solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I didn't like, like, like uh, <laughs> it was just tough. But like, and, and so Iraq, the first six months, Missoula was kind of whatever. Like we had a good mission because um, we had NAI set up. We were doing some NTISR. We like we took a. This is a. Uh, it's now a theme for me taking mortar rounds. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> So we're in the brigade talk and we took a mortar round at the front door of the brigade talk Jeez. on the Zool. Like the, the J six, the S six desk, it's like in there, like as he came in, like shredded, like it was ridiculous. Right. Wow. Um, but I had, we had, so we had Q 36 counterfire, like poos and the point of origin. Uh, and my a tens were looking in that NAI where it originated from. So we actually got eyes on the vehicle. Nice. Um, and we had, we had Rover for the first time. Um, so we we're actually able to follow those dudes back. Um, like via rover, maintain uh, custody, be the data link and uh, the video link, and um, ended up doing a raid on that house. Uh, massive weapons cache. There was like a local real estate agent that was being held hostage uh, for monies. And if we hadn't found him that night, supposedly he was going to be executed by the, the the terrorist group there. Man, that's um, huge. Which is that's... it's kind of cool, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and like the so dude, one thing I was saying was getting messed up by snipers big time, and so we like. We took their sniper off the street and we took uh, their indirect fire like leader off the street. Nice. Um, so we saw like it. So that was really cool. Um, uh, but then uh, I did my six months and they sent us back because I was supposed to PCA to Anchorage. And um, that's when the uh, surge and extension happened. Mm. So I was home for like 10 days, got sent back to Baghdad. Oh my God. I was, dude, it was the saddest thing in the world because like they were like Fort Wainwright. They're, like, welcome home, dad. Welcome home, honey. Like, all the posters and signs you see when you come back from deployment, like welcome home. Nothing dude. Cause those dudes were like on a C 17 to come home. I'm like, well, we're just going to fly to Baghdad. Then. Like imagine having to tell the family. Oh, Even I can't insanity. imagine. I, we, uh, I, we've talked about this very thing on this, on this show uh, a couple times. And I, I just can't, regardless of the, the reason or the situation or what, I just can't fathom how they justified doing that to those guys. I mean, that's just crazy, man. Dude, and like, man, they'd like they'd lost guys already, man. Like yeah. they they'd had a tough fifteen months, right? Um, and no wonder, like, like not to like say so, like not to glamorize or like promote trauma. Like, no wonder dudes are messed up for sure. Oh, 100%. no wonder, no wonder dudes have a hard time. Like, no wonder marriages suffered and failed because they <laughs> totally screwed these guys. Oh yeah. Um, well, they screwed like, him. My personal opinion, they screwed him by having to be there for 15 months straight anyway, let alone not letting him come home for a little bit at least. And then sending him, I mean, it's, that's, it's, yeah, that's not that you're not taking care of your troops when you're doing stuff like that for sure. 
No, not at all. And then we got like, dude, we got to we got the buy app to bag that international airport. And I forget who it was at like the Air Force, like the AOC or whatever it was there um, at the palace. And they're like, don't get it in your head. You guys are calling airstrikes. You guys are doing non traditional ISR only. That is all you are here for. I'm like, well, what are we doing here, man? You don't need a JTAC to do anti ISR. Right. I was furious. Yeah. I was like, I was so mad. Um, and, and that's, and, and to be fair, like I say that not saying that anyone should agree with me that I should be mad. I would, I would argue there's a lot of immaturity that went in with that, that feeling. Um, I probably didn't have a good big picture. I was thinking about myself and wanting to go to Anchorage and stand up the airborne unit. I didn't, I was all done sure. with this. This was like, so there's a lot of immaturity that we need to kind of like couch that anger with, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, you know, but in your defense, but, uh, uh, that it, it is combat. So there is no, there are no hard and fast rules. So to say that initially is kind of a kick to the pills because they don't know what's going to happen in the future. You know, you may need to do some casts. So it's kind of, it's just, it's, it, it doesn't it was, seem it productive to tell you that as soon as you got back, you know, to, like, like, I think, yeah. So like two or three more Alaska dudes got killed, shot in the head. We had a bunch more EFPs, like just melt strikers geez. and ruin lives. It was like, for what? For yeah. Like what? Like we didn't even own battle space. It was ridiculous, man. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I was pretty negative. Uh, at that point and then um we got back from iraq and this is where it really sucks for me um where i messed up so went to avon park for a, for an exercise um and uh we were doing the the dry cast moa stuff out in the out in the freaking town dude i was having the best mission of my life we were finally in corporate jfos like uh i was I was like, dude, I'm so good. Like, and not from a coffee standpoint, I was like, dude, this is going really well. Like, we were having a good time. Right. Like, we were meeting the objectives. And I remember seeing on Rover, as I, I said, you know, continue dry. Um, I remember seeing on Rover this this body walk across this other vehicle. And then I remember that person's head sticking inside my vehicle and say, hey, check your coordinates. So I watched this dude on Rover on the target I thought I was doing a dry cast run on with a GBU-12. And uh, actually, yeah, GB12. And uh, I was I was doing a dry cast run on myself. Oh, my God. Um, there are a lot of things that went into that situation. Then a day, I'm the one who said, continue to drive, so it's my fault. Yeah. Um, and I saw, I'm like, then I realized I'm looking at myself. Oh, man. And the pilot didn't know either. He was like, he thought we were having a great mission. He didn't know until we debriefed. Was like, hey, and that's when we killed ourselves. Wow. Um, that was, dude, that was devastating. Uh, it was embarrassing. It was shameful. It was, it was a blow to my ego. I embarrassed the team. Uh, I, my team lost faith in me. Um, like, it was, it was awful. Yeah. Um, they put me on duties not to include controlling while they kind of like figured out what the hell they're going to do with me. Like one NCO was like, dude, we're going to probably kick you out of the Air Force for this. For a dry mission like that? Dude, yeah, man. It was, it was, so it, there was like, there was, Alaska, like I said, Alaska was a great place. It was not a great, like a great location. It was not my favorite tactic assignment. Yeah. Um, for a lot of reasons. Most of them my fault. Right. <laughs> uh, dude, I did like write, because my roadmap was in the car. I had to write like a pretend, sorry, I killed your son letter. Wow. Like, it was not sweet. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I would just walk around the ASOS. Just everyone knows that I'm the guy who killed himself. Super embarrassed. Yeah. Like, just awful, man. So I got my remedial training. Um, they found out what I did wrong. Um, basically, I just got sucked into Rover. Didn't pay pay attention to things, like bit off on some stuff. But I was like, I was still, I went from being this really cocky, cocky tack P, and probably shouldn't have been a cocky tack P, to like a deflated human of a tack P. Yeah. Um, did my eval, my re eval, I guess. Failed that. Um, hooked it. Um, they didn't like how I deconflicted airspace uh, and how I mitigated effects of a round of a, of a bomb. Um, so like, man, failed safety. I'm like, mm. like this is it. I'm done, man. Um, and then you know, I I did a I did my re re on Ielson Air Force Base. Alan Hawk, um, uh, gave me he came up from Anchorage because they needed an objective observer to to uh, objective evaluator. To, like it was it was everyone knew like I was the stinky kid in class. Yeah, right. It was bad. Um, I passed. Uh, thankfully, I think I think after like. I think there is a point where they take away your JTAC you know, certification for like in the, in the reg somewhere, like for sucking so bad. <laughs> but thankfully I passed. Yeah. Um, then we went to NTC. 
I'm still really nervous. Uh, you know, striker mission again. Uh, I was using JFOs again. Uh, I was doing a dry mission, and I did all the continuing drives, all the things. I we done all the things. My Romad double checked me. We wiped my ass, all the things. <laughs> and I see the OC walk over to me. He's like, "I'm like, I cannot believe I did it again. Can't believe I did it again." He's like, "Hey man, you gotta stop doing cast." I'm like. He's like, you, you blew up the battlefield. Like the, the mission's over. <laughs> so like, I'd actually like done the right thing. I, I was like, oh my God. Like, Oh, that'd be such a relief. <laughs> oh, I was so like, he's like, yeah, like we're not doing cats anymore. Cause the army has to do their like training. Right. Like, yeah. you, 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 you did it for them. Yeah, like yeah. they need to do the job. So I was like, oh my God, I was just sick to my stomach again. And, uh, you know, then, um, I got an opportunity to, to go to the schoolhouse after this. And I was, dude, I was. I was also, man, I was just, like, no one got better at, ta- at being a tac ta- in Alaska at that period. Like we weren't doing, we were in running scenarios. Like we were like, Hey, go, go control the cast. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I got a two ship and like, make sure my 18 degrees of declination are correct. And, right. um, <laughs> magnetic variance or whatever is, is good. Yeah, yeah. Like, no one was getting like any better, man. Like we weren't controlling like, you know, dissimilar platforms. We were in like, and that's, I could, I could have done that. I could insert those into my own scenarios. But I didn't do it. Right. 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 Um, but it just wasn't like no one was getting better. And I was like, man, I'm kind of, I'm kind of tired of this. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Ivan Rankin was the superintendent of the schoolhouse. Um, and there was a schoolhouse slot open. I was like, Hey man, can I come be an instructor? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so I was stoked. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was like, man, if I never control cats again, I'm happy. That's how, I, that's how this sounds. Ugh, Such a roller coaster. Myself, yeah. <laughs> it was just tough, dude. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so I got to schoolhouse. I think like every instructor, they probably love their first two years, second two years, they're just counting down the days to be done. Yeah. Um, and we were in a unique period of time. And did you ever instruct in schoolhouse? No, nope, never did. No, no, never made it down there. Um, okay. Well, it was like, we were going through kind of like a weird phase where like we didn't have budget and also a ton of scrutiny by AETC. We just like on like, you couldn't call it a shark session, like PT session, right? right, right. That's too mean. That, that ended, like, it, or like a, a, it was called demotivational training. It's like, <laughs> it was actually called DMT, demotivational training. Like, like this can't be in the, the syllabus. This can't be in the POI. Yeah, yeah. And so we had these, these herbivores, just these academics literally from ATC. Like one guy showed up and was like, why is this 12 mile ruck march requirement in here? Why can't they just do like two miles a day for six days? <laughs> or, I called this dude garbage pants because he was so fat. Like, um, like he could probably wear a fifty-five gallon bag, like garbage bag. Like I called him garbage pants. Right. Um, I don't actually know, know his name, and not very nice to me, but still. Hey. Um. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, um, Chief Lundquist became our our student lieutenant too, which mm-hmm. is cool. Um, you know, he had a tab, and I thought it was that I, I thought it was awesome, and um. You know, uh, my my boss, I think you know him, Ross Robinson. Yeah. Ray Robinson. Great dude. Great dude. Yeah. Yeah, really good dude. dude. Like smart as hell. Um, you know, really, really unique guy. And um he had a tab too. Yeah. And um so he became my like flight chief. I was like a, I was a block instructor, I was a block chief, but he was like the flight chief. Mm. Um and we were we were I was running the field. And uh you know, of course, I'm like, oh, turn out the 17th, you know, like, super cool. Like, I'll never be able to go because I failed Eva and I bombed myself. <laughs> you know, like, I, like, yeah. like my career is going to be boring and vanilla forever. Yeah. He's like, you know, and then he, that's when he said, he's like, hey, man, you think no one's failed Eva on the 17th? I'm like, no, like, why would you be allowed to be there? He's like, people make mistakes, man. Yeah. And and no one had ever framed anything like that. I, I've been beating myself up for years at this point, just just crushing myself. He's like, you think people don't make mistakes? You don't people you don't think people have bad days? I'm like, no, man, you can't have a bad day at 17th. He's like, that is incorrect. Yeah. Way incorrect. Um, he's yeah. like, he's like, I think you should apply and go to the 17th. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, I, I support you go to the 17th. And, and Chief Lunkus was there as well. I was a good instructor, man. I'm sure some students think I was an asshole. Yeah. I was a good instructor. I was, you know, I think I'm a good tech B period, minus sucking. <laughs> um you know, uh, so I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, so I got my phase one package together, like, submitted that. And I was, I mean, I couldn't lie about failing. Right. 
I couldn't lie about what I'd done. You had to submit your JTAC reference. Right. You had to bit, it's in there. All your yeah. It's in there, man. Um, I was, I was like, uh, so nervous. And they invited me to phase two. Nice. Um, you know, and I, thankfully I was fit, right? <laughs> Dude, the guys that were, uh, the cadre for the, like people like Matty Green. Yeah. Richie Douglas, <laughs> uh, like all these amazing soft tack bees, like legendary, like with, you know, muster stains on the jump wings, like have made like amazing, you know, uh, impacts to the community. Like those are my, my cadre for the 17th right. for the, for the phase two. Um, I was like, he's like, there's probably not, I'm not going to make it. These guys are too good. They can smell my, my stain from a mile away. They don't want me on the team. <laughs> I think 16 guys showed up. Three of us made it. Right. Nice. Um, and of those three guys, like one's a lawyer now, one's a, a patch, and then there's me. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, and then I was really adamant about going to the second, going to the second regular time. Like, and they're like, why do you want it? Like, you had like do some writing assignments, like all selections. I'm sure it's changed in, in the past, whatever years. They're like, well, you want to be a soft tech B, you know, like, whatever. And I'm like, when I go to the second range of Italian and or join 17th SDS debt too, like I was very deliberate, like <laughs> knowing full well that I didn't really have a choice, but I was right, like, right. pretty clear that I wanted to go to Washington State. Um, and get picked up, uh, went to AST, uh, which is advanced skills training. So they put us through three months of AST. Now we have our own OTC uh, run at Benning, right. which is actually really amazing. I know, it's cool. Um, and then, so amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like the community has gone, come so far. Like I was, I was a selected for the 17th ASOS and we were, while we were getting reflagged to the 17th STS, yeah, yeah. Um, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I went to the 17th and dude, it was the coolest. And I love being a conventional tag P. I mean that minus like doing some really dumb things. Like I, I don't want to take away from being a conventional tag P at all. Cause it, like I had some really amazing experiences. For right? sure. Like some of my most formative experiences as a conventional tag P, but like, man, uh, well, be before you go too much farther, I want to hit on this because that's a good point. The reason that uh, guys like you and you know Matty Green and those guys are so good when they get to the soft side of it is because of the conventional background they had. Like having that solid um, CAS TACP or conventional TACP background is almost integral to be successful in the soft world because you. Because then you, you get to the soft world, you learn all the soft stuff, but then you have that the close air support background, the conventional side of it, which is a lot of people don't get. So, yeah, to your point. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be a little, I'm going to be a little romantic here too. Um, like, so like, first I want to say like, I think conventional tack piece today, the way we train and we organize and we equip is so much better than it was 24 years ago. It's insane. Yeah. Like they're like, I'm confident a, a day one JTAC at a conventional unit would, without a doubt, out control me on my best days. Conventional TAC now, yeah, yeah. But, but like they're just so much better now. Yeah, they're doing um, the right thing for sure right now. They're doing the right thing, and a lot of like the Abrams Charter of like getting guys back out to the community and uh, kind of spreading that like that wealth and that knowledge and having patches now. I think a lot of things have kind of converged and coalesced to make a conventional TAC an amazing TAC like. So like what I was as a conventional attack fee probably would not stand up remotely to what a conventional attack fee is today. Oh, for sure. Um, for sure. You know, but when, when I got to the 17th and this is the part where I started to be a little romantic, like it's the greatest freaking group of warriors on the planet, man. Yeah. It's like these men, and this is not saying the conventional attack fees aren't, but in a consolidated concentrated space of a, of a 17th detachment, these men are so freaking committed yeah. to being the absolute best at the highest level possible every day. Like the Pareto principle is out the freaking window. Yeah. There's no like 20% doing 8% of the work or like whatever. Like I always said like a hundred percent of the guys on, 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 I think it's like two troop or silver team. I don't know what it is now. Right. Uh, if, if you watch the state, a hundred percent of the guys were dedicated yeah. to doing a hundred percent of the work. And that's not like a, I'm not pulling that from the Ranger Creed. Um, but I think that's a really important line from Ranger Creed. Um, but like, it was the most amazing group of men committed to being absolute masters at their craft yep. to, to, to an idea, to, to, a, to, a, to an extent I never witnessed in my life. Right. I like, I knew I was going to 17th. I knew they were really good. I had no true concept <laughs> how good these men were. Right. Like 
mind blowing. Like, dude, Earl Colville, you know, gone before me. Yeah. Freaking uh, Jordan Jacobowski is who you just had on two shows ago. I fell on his. I fell in on, on his call sign. Yeah. Um, Brandon Temple was at, at that too. Um, Charlie Keebaugh, uh, you know, Zachary. Uh, all these amazing, like like Josh Howard, Evan Serpa, <laughs> all these amazing dudes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we're at the set. Ezekiel Rodriguez, like all these names that Jordan's already talked about, like Burt Reynolds, like all these dudes were amazing. And right, like, right. then I show up, <laughs> right? And then there's me, right? So, and and I don't think people also understand to the legacy and history of the Second Ranger Battalion. We are the boys of Point to Hawk. So to be part of the Seventeenth at Second Ranger Battalion, the battalion that had done like. They did like fire maneuver up up caving ladders at Point the Hawk on D Day. Right. Like that's insanity. Yeah. And when you go into the battalion the headquarters, like there's a there's a there's a Nazi flag on the wall that was taken from Point the Hawk. Yeah. And there's flags from Panama. And there's like this legacy and history of like oh, the yeah. Ranger. It's and I'm sure like third third bat and first bat all all feel the same way about like, you know, guys jumping the Grenada or guys doing uh, so this point, all these in like Mogadishu, like I'm not taking anything away from like those battalions and the regiment as a whole, but like walking into the second Ranger battalion yeah. and seeing the history. Yeah. And you're like, I cannot believe that I'm even remotely <laughs> around this thing. Right. Right. Um, and then going back to the, the, the JTAX at 17th SDS at that too. I mean, like, like I'd never seen before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh there's this thing called operation scrutinize i don't know if they still do it i don't need to call it scrutinize still but basically they take every bad day from the guys that were there and they roll it into a single sim and it is your first sim mission i had no clue what i was walking into <laughs> zero clue and it was messed up from the word go yeah like <laughs> And then, like I, I remember like all the radio traffic in there intensely like overwhelming you. They kind of well, they want to see where your left and right limits are, True. you know, like in a very severe way to find out like, hey, can you deconflict airspace? Can you maintain sensors? Can you, you know, mit- can you mitigate weapons effects? Can you communicate to the ground commander? Can you do all these things? Oh, can you call in Kazavaks and do HLC breeze? I'm like, ah. <laughs> um, and so it's 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 not designed for you to be successful. I don't believe. Um, <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is uh this is different. Yeah, this is this is like cast I've never seen ever heard of like you know fifteen assets in the sky like like what's the, what's the you know what's the weapons status for the six, the little birds like I'm like uh, they've got some <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just ridiculous and yeah. like it's a sim like uh, so I did that and the biggest thing is like we don't want to embarrass the team like we want St. Ray Battalion to believe that like if it's, if our call sign shows up like it's dude like they're getting the best right right. Like they want that. They, we have to have that trust. Yeah. Um, so it has to be brutal. And then we did a, there's like a, it's like Leshy town or some Mount site on, on Fort, Fort Lewis. Um, looks like an old like German village. And uh, dude, <laughs> it was a nighttime mission, but it was in the day. Mm-hmm. So like, I was like marking the LZ and I just wave, wave my hand like this, <laughs> like with my pretend IR pointer. Yeah. And I remember getting yelled at from across the compound about, Oh, we're just not going to fucking do the right thing today. <laughs> And I was like, and it had already gone bad in the first place. Yeah. Um, you know, I got back in the truck and I was like, oh, frick. And then I remember just sitting in the team room getting debriefed and like, I was told like, they, like, we never want to see that shit again. Yeah. I'm like, okay, got it. Cool. Got it. And it was a bad day. And I was sitting on like, so we have an uh, Olympic lifting platform. Josh Howard, nicest guy on the planet. Um, sitting on the Olympic lifting platform, just kind of like my head down, feeling like poopy pants. And he like comes to give me a high five. And I'm just like, He's like, no high five. I'm like, no high five, man. <laughs> and I remember going to an office, Max or a Staples. It was raining. It was a Friday. That was the, you know, we're going to end it. I got a, I got a whiteboard, got some markers. And I spent the entire weekend kind of going back to what I did in Missoula, just writing down scenarios and then writing down what I would do. And like just drawing things like drawing range fans and drawing call for fire, like doing everything on this whiteboard all weekend long. Yeah. All I did. 
And that's when I kind of started turning around as a, like, I started like, I didn't like, I didn't go the next day. It wasn't like, you know, a, a, a rom-com where all of a sudden I was like magical. Right. Um, but I started kind of knocking things. I started getting better. Yeah. Like I would just go on kit runs and I would just do call for fires. I would bring, uh, you know, some guys with me and we just put stuff like, I was like, I cannot screw this up. I, I have to pass my eval. I, I cannot, I can't screw, yeah. <laughs> screw this up. Um, you know, and I, I had control cats for four years because I was a technical instructor. So oh, I was also, right. also in a right. weird caps too. That. So I had to like, I had to like requal, like I had to like go through basically like M- IQT or MQT. Yeah. Essentially again. Um, so that was like really awkward too because I was an E6 and you had like E4s and E5s on the team that were just like, they'd, they'd already been getting after it, man. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I had I to like unscrew myself too in front of Ranger because they like looked at me like I was super experienced and like I'd had four years I was a control cast. Yeah. Um, so uh, got some deployments with, with Ranger um, and uh, you know, like the first, the first uh, mission I did with Ranger screwed it up, dropped the center plan. We lost the guy. Like it was like, Oh, but hang on. I didn't realize how good Ranger was at doing Ranger things until like combat. Yeah. The best. I, I mean, I knew how good they were, but like you got to see it. Yeah. Right. It's almost indescribable Dude. what they do. It's just amazing. It's un like Ranger is the world's greatest fighting force to ever assault an objective. Mm-hmm. Uh, like just this. And like they, it's, it's amazing what they do. Yeah. And so we do an X landing within right close to the, the house. Homeboy pops out with a, a weapon. The heavy weapons team shot his heart out. Like it wasn't like they were like all over the place either. Like they weren't like, they were like, bah, 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 bah. They were like yeah. Precise for Coast. sure. Yeah. Post. I saw the dude's body. I was like, wow, there's a reason. <laughs> Rangers this good. It was it was remarkable. Um and it's also so I, I screwed the center plan uh and then on Xville um bringing in the aircraft is just like more funny than serious. But I Xville is also like the most stressful point for me uh, unless we're getting shot at because everyone has a good idea on Xville. I'm like right. shut up. <laughs> like I gotta bring like three helicopters in and not wreck them and keep you all safe. And also like we all want to go home just like yeah. <laughs> um, I don't want to hear it. Um, and uh, so, you know, just because they come in this way, doesn't mean they're land like on a certain heading, they, they can change their heading for, for the actual landing piece. Mm-hmm. Dude, the one sixty guy came in, like he basically tail whipped over my head and I was up on this, this terrace. He just freaking flew me. <laughs> like he like <laughs> flew me off the terrace. <laughs> like, Oh God. <laughs> um, and it was like, I was like, Ugh, what a perfect ending to a, a perfect night yeah. uh, for me. <laughs> but uh I, but also like you know you see how great 160s is doing their job man oh like, yeah just exceptional like so that was a really good mission in a lot of ways and then we just did tons of missions that that trip tons of missions um and then uh we'll kind of skip because i you know i just did you know mlats and all things and ended up getting to be the team chief nice. eventually so from like going to be a, a cockadoo attack v who sucked and had a really low time um whether it's like the you know, attrition or just uh, I kind of hung on the longest or I was the highest ranking and they didn't have a choice. I don't know, but like I got to be the team chief of, of debt too. Um, as we rolled into what would end up being my last deployment with, uh, with Ranger in the 17th. Um, I, uh, we all know that there's another mission that we support. Um, that's not super attached to the regiment, but it's still the regiment. Yeah. Um, so I was on that mission or I was on that, on that deployment. It was my, like my trip like that, you know, I got to have my beard and do all the things. It's fun. Um, a little, little fob tucked into the mountains just outside, of, outside of Kandahar. I think everyone knows where that is now. Um, also one of my most dynamic trips in my life. Oh, uh, so I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think I've been in more gunfights yeah. in that trip, you know, and it's like, I'm in like 16 years of my career at this point, 15, 16 years of my career, um, where I wasn't scared or bothered in my first mission as a 19, 20 year old. I had some trepidations because <laughs> I, I was like, man, it's a, it's like every, people always got blown up in front of me or behind me or like, like shot next to me or something like nothing ever happened to me. Right. Like per se. I'm like, man, it's like a matter of time, dude. Yeah. You know, so you start getting a little nervous, mm-hmm. like just a little like caution. Like, oh, this is, and you, in the caution, the caution, you're, you're measuring what you're doing against like what you're accomplishing. Right. 
like back when I was 20, like, dude, let's go on every single mission. <laughs> right. Let's just go. Yeah. And like, now I'm like, is this guy really the guy? <laughs> right. Are we just, are we screwing off right now? What's, what's going on, guys? Yeah. <laughs> like, but like, I can't say no to like going out with the boys and getting after it. Sure, sure. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, and we also had some really restrictive ROE at that time. Uh, like policy changes and all the things were making it really weird. Um, and uh, I'll give an example. Like we were in a we were in a gunfight, and AWT were holding off away from us, and they're like, "We're waiting for clearance to come in." I'm like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "I'm like, keen to hand, like there are gunshots going on behind me. They can hear it." I'm like, "Like guys, you hear that? Like we need help. Yeah, yeah. like we got to get approval from the air base commander at CAF." if we can expend the gas because there was only so much gas allocated to like a certain amount of hours of like combat versus like base security. Jeez. And so I'm like, weird. I'm like guys, super weird. And like our, our customer was like, what are they doing, man? Yeah. So now like my trust has been degraded with them. Cause like I can't deliver the asset. Oh, for sure. Yeah, they're not thinking that like, the, yeah, the helos aren't coming in. They're thinking, hey, Air Force, why aren't you bringing in these helos? Like, what, what are you doing? Even the fact that, like, I couldn't convince them to, like, use the gas, even though we were in a gunfight. Like, you can't do anything for us. I'm like, I'm trying to get them over here. Like, yeah. like um, or they'd be on station, they'd check out. I'm like, hey, guys, the second you guys leave, like, if you guys don't have a replacement, because that was another thing, like, like, they couldn't replace, they couldn't, like, do swaps of aircraft. Yeah. Like, I'm like the second you guys leave, like we're gonna get another gunfight. Like we know. And then I had NQ9s overhead. Like that was like pseudo effective sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, it was just a really like it was a really weird period of time for the entire task force. Yeah. Um, not just us, it's the whole task force, right? Um it's the closest I've come to dying was this trip. Um there's a, a gunfight in a little area called Maywand. Um, which I'm sure some guys are familiar with. And uh, it was like a 12 hour long gunfight. We we're just in a gunfight all day long. Um, and uh, there was one time where, like, down below is berm, like, not the berm, but, like an irrigation dish, right? And um, so, like, just some dirt in front of our face. And, like, we've got some tall grass in front of us. I pick my head up. I start, like, with my mouth open because I'm a mouth breather. <laughs> and I start getting, like, dirt in my mouth from bullets kicking dirt in my face. Jeez. And I just, like, and me and my buddy, or on the on the deck, like like, dude, I'm as I'm as low as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> and I usually like, <laughs> I'm like, which is not a unique experience. Guys have been shot at lots of times, so like the experience is not unique, right? Like I'm not like so, but um, but, yeah, but it's still it's like, never good. I mean, no matter how many not, times you've, you've been like, under fire, that's still bad. Like the the dirt wall behind us, where there's a compound behind us, like which is getting stitched up, and uh. You know we're gonna we're gonna break contact and we're gonna move to a better location so we can actually do some work because um, we're fairly well pinned down. Um, we had guys stuck in a compound too, and uh, this is ridiculous. And uh, so I jump up and I just do you know returns the fire and I sprint out and then and I'm getting a bullet hole in my pants. So you know like that extra pocket on the front of your uh, on the front thigh of your your multi cams. Yeah. So like because that extends, that's like protrudes. <laughs> I uh, I got a bull hole in my pants that Jeez. day. Uh, those, uh, those, those pants are now shorts, and I mow the yard in them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, I'd never been faster in my life either. Oh my god, I was fast that day. Um, you know, and God got the wall. Like, and then um, we were we're finally like we're fuck, we're over it. This is this day is this pointless, yeah. right? Um, <clears throat> we get back to the to the convoy, the gaff, um, and. Our our truck driver, our, our Hilux driver, is our PJ, okay. um, and he's never driven stick before until this trip, oh, really. <laughs> um, and uh, it's me in the backseat with my with the RTO, and we're driving. We get stuck in sand, like you get stuck in snow. Yeah. And an ambush initiates on our vehicle. Yeah. Damn. And and like the convoy took off. Oh no. Uh, thankfully, we had trucks behind us, but oh. like I remember looking at my rto and like because he was on like the ambush side yeah, yeah uh and i'm like i was just i'm looking at him i was like i'm gonna watch him die and then i'm gonna die this is we're done man <laughs> and then uh our, our partner force rolls up and they got some really great guns in the truck they just start and we get out and push the truck out and 
like where you get an ambush the whole way back up to the convoy. Like it's just this ridiculous situation. Jeez. Um, and, uh, you know, and um, this is also the last trip. I, and I, I really want to talk about this, not really want to talk about it, but like, it's important. Um, so, so not knowing is my last combat deployment yet. I, we were in a, on a mission and we were getting shot at. We had the guys on a motorcycle and uh, at AWT on station. Great. <laughs> they were actually allowed to fly this time. Great. <laughs> um, so ended up doing a call for fire on those guys, took them out. Um, I actually never said this to anyone, but and that's the last call for I ever did in my, in my, my career. Um, I didn't get emotional. Like I wanted to cry, but I was kind of overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, and like, I was just like, I think I was exhausted. I don't know what it was, but like, I didn't feel, I was, I mean, I happy, I was happy. I did my job. Yeah. But I was just like, it's kind of, it was tough. I don't know why. I didn't feel bad about killing the guys. Um, it's just, it was just emotional for some reason. Um, I don't know. And I, I can't explain it. Man, I mean, you've been doing this since the beginning and it's like, you know, after a while it takes its toll on you. You know, it's just, it, it, it becomes, I think to, I think for a lot of guys, it becomes less cool and more like a slog. And it's and that, like, it's it just emotionally, it's a, it's a, you know, having that heightened awareness and that heightened sense of purpose all the time just is exhausting. It was, it was a relief. I did it right. It was the relief that it, like, it wasn't us. Like, it was just like, I was like, ugh. And then that same day, um, we'd had a, one of our partner force vehicles hit a an ID. Yeah. They were just in the back, uh, in the, in the bed. And one guy got his kind of his, his face peeled off a little bit, mm. you know? Um, and, uh, we knew we were going to hit IDs. Like, we, just, we knew it. Yeah. Like, we, like, we're like, this is going to suck. Like, show, something out. So, um, and this goes back to Operation Scrutinize, um, where like I had like three troops in contact at one time, and I was having to in the sim in the scenario in the sim like three troops in contact, maintaining a squirter, doing a casvac, all these things. Like it goes, and it also goes back to like having to change fills and vehicle nav and do all these things in the cold, and like people like you can do more than one thing at a time, and like then going to the sim, like oh my gosh, so much, so many things are happening, right? Yeah. Um, and then going to the final real world scenario where like we were in troops in contact, we had an IED, a guy had been hurt. Uh, I'm calling in dust off. Uh, the EOD team is clearing the HLZ. I'm doing the HLZ and Kazakh briefs, uh, managing all the other air assets. And like, so, so it was the same day I did the call for fire, right? I felt more pride in myself and was like, happier that I'd done the Kazakh and like managed all the things yeah. really well that day. Because like the the dude he's alive, like he, he lived and all things and yeah, yeah. I was more proud that like I was, all this all these things that like finally come together and like I, I did it. Yeah. Right. Like I was I was more proud of getting that dude out of there and doing it well and getting him taken care of than, a, than I was like just doing a little shitty call for fire on two dudes in a motorcycle. I didn't really care. Right, right. I was like, Ugh. Well, I mean there's so, a there's a, a a higher purpose behind getting your own guys out than, you know, just taking out another threat. You know, so I could understand that for sure. Yeah. So I was, I was, I was just happy. I was like, that's interesting that I was, I was more happy doing that than I was doing a kinetic piece. Mm -hmm. um, you know, something I, I thought about. But um, so on the same trip, uh, came back from a, another mission, another gunfight, and um, we had Wi-Fi on our base, right? Like we could talk and text, and you know, I message, you can talk to people. <laughs> Pick up my phone, and. Um, Someone sent me, my family friend sent me a text like, hey, we found your mom a mile away from the house. I said she's going to Texas. My mom lives in Ohio. That's a little bit of a walk for my mom, right? Um, so they're like, they're like, hey, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm going to Texas. Oh, man. So clearly, like, some dots are not connecting, right? Sure. Um, find out she's been having, like, these seizures and, like, Lou body dementia. Like, she had, her brain was going. Mm. Um, and going back to like my brothers, like I'm the only one left. Um, and despite anything happening to his kids, like the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me is adopt me. Yeah. Like you and I wouldn't be having this conversation if I wasn't adopted. Like right. I, I wouldn't have like this house and my wife and these, my kids, like I wouldn't have any of this stuff, man. Um, so I had to figure out a way to solve the problem. And it's not the solution I wanted, man. Uh, it was leave the 17th and join the air national guard. 
And me leaving the 17th made some people mad. Um, they did not like that. Uh, and that was not my intent, but they felt like I was quitting the team. And I felt like I was quitting the team. Like, he didn't even make me feel any worse. I felt like I was, I was, I was the team chief of it. Like, I was the, the best job in the Air Force. Yeah. Like, that's the last thing I want to do is leave the team. Um, but, uh, you know, um, it, it, it made some people upset with me. Um, and, uh, but I was also confused. Like, I'm doing the right thing for my family. Like, right. my mom was like, her brain's like Swiss cheese now. Like, she's walking to Texas. She lives in Ohio. Like, I'm the only one left. Like, I've, I've got to go take care of this problem. For sure. Um, so, um, reached out to my buddy Roman, who I mentioned initially, uh, who was now the Intel patch at the 174th um, attack wing in Syracuse, New York, which is an MQ-9 base. Okay. And interestingly enough, <laughs> I was using their call sign on that mission okay. that I came back from. So they were supporting task force, which is cool. Um, and I and I wanted an active duty slot. I was an E seven. The the TACP shop in Syracuse didn't have an active duty slot. Um, I was like, I need an active duty guard slot, man. He's like, I think we can get you one. I I had a four year degree in Intel already. Um, I was actually doing grad school on that deployment too. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So long story short, got back from that deployment, um, and uh, left active duty, and. Move my wife and I, we didn't have a kid at the time, Move my wife and I crossed the United States to Syracuse, New York. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot, a, too much time here because um, it's not really a remarkable time in the context of like my career. Sure. But I like, dude, Intel is freaking awesome. I, I think Intel, like, yeah, sure. I have a four-year Intel degree, but that's like, you did a bunch of book reports. You didn't really do anything. Yeah. Right. Um, but I knew the customer that they were supporting because it was me. It was my teammates. Right. Um, and uh, like the way I explain Intel, especially Intel and direct support to an MQ-9 or an assets that, that is directly involved in combat is that Intel professionals in this off source intelligence model, they should be the most bloodthirsty people in the room. Cause the only way you get to a target is Intel develops a target. Right. That's why beginning of every packet is like a road to war. How did we get here? Yeah. What intelligence did we do to validate this target? That means, and I, I equate it to hunting. Uh, if you're out of state, if you're an out of state hunter, I think you have to, you like legally have to have a guide for hunting in Alaska. I think who knows the most about the animal, the guide, right. the guide is being paid to put you in the very best position to do the thing that you want to do, which is kill the animal, right. harvest the animal, like have the greatest experience of your life. Same thing with Intel. Intel, their job is to put you, like, give you all the information they know about the about the enemy, to put you in the best spot to murder as many bad guys as possible. Right. Like that's what Intel is, and um, that is not a commonly shared feeling <laughs> with traditional Intel analysts. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not something they think about, and. Uh, I was really, op my eyes really open to that when I went to Intel school in Goodfell Air Force Base. Like when I went to TACP school, they said, oh, why do you want to be here? I'm like, we all want to like, want to do cool things. We love our country. We want to get after it. There are 30 brand new airmen from basic training in our class. It was like me and two other prior service guys. And not one of them said they wanted to serve their country. And I'm not, that's not an exaggeration. That's not like, they, not one of them was like, they were like, I want the benefits. I want to get money for college. I just want to get out of town. Like not one of them like, I love America. I want to go crush our nation's enemies. Nothing even remotely related to that. I was like, oh, this is different. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. And that's when I started realizing that maybe the time I had left will be, I will do the minimum amount of time I have left, which is like, I did 21 years, right? Um, but Intel for MQ-9, supporting task force, was amazing. Yeah. I loved the Intel piece of it. The Air National Guard, like the idea of it, I'm like, it just wasn't for me after 16 years. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I was, I was too much of a regular active duty guy. Sure. But the people in the guard were amazing. Like they took care of me, took care of my family. Um, because what also happened when I joined the guard was, you know, taking care of my mom, getting her like in a home. My wife ended up getting stage three cancer. Jeez. Um, yeah. Uh, dude, she's awesome now. We have a two and a half year old son. 
like so we're she's like five years cancer free so it's amazing nice um but like when my wife got cancer the guard was like take care of your family like sweet they like gave me all the latitude and support to make sure my wife was good nice um and we actually sent my wife home to Utah to, to come to the Cancer Institute here because it's like one of the best in the country. So I was traveling back and forth a lot and I was still doing grad school at the time. And like right after my wife uh, beat cancer, um, I was writing my, my capstone of my thesis for grad school. And I was sitting at a desk, Thursday night football was on, I was typing away and I had my Apple watch on. And all of a sudden like my heart felt funny. And I was like, that's weird, my, my heart rate's 190. Um, my resting heart rate early day was like 55. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this isn't right. Um, Roman came and got me, took me to the hospital because I thought I was having a heart attack and dying. Um, got to the hospital. I wasn't having a heart attack. They're like, hey, is there anything in your life that's stressful? I'm like, I don't think so. Like, I'm like, I'm, I've got a house. I've got a job. Like, And then Roman was like, hey, what about, and then, you know, combat, my wife, we were like, she was in Utah. I was in New York. Yeah. Uh, weirdly enough, dude, uh, Intel people don't get a lot of credit. Cause like when you're in on the teams, like you go to combat and you go home, right? Like you have a, you have a combat place and then you have like an America place. All right. Intel people don't have that in the, especially in the MQ9 space. Like they have like a combat room. Then they go to another room. Where like you're not allowed to talk about anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's called like outside. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there's no like it's really weird. Like these dudes are actually under, these guys and gals are actually weirdly under a lot of stress because they're they're seeing super messed up things. Yeah. Like and then they walk out the room it's like nothing happened. They can't go home again. They can't like it's very strange. It's not something like I would have been like whatever nerds <laughs> as a tech people. Like now that I did it, I'm like oh, it can take a toll on you. Um. So like all these things combined, apparently I was uh, starting to, to realize the, the the PTSD and depression stuff. Oh, okay. Um, in a pretty significant way. Um, so I started getting help though. Um, immediately they threw a bunch of drugs at me. Of course, uh, didn't like I was like, dude, they gave me like a, a, a Xanax. I never taken a, an opioid in my life. Yeah. Like I hey, take some Xanax for like acute stress. I'm like, I'll take a half of one. Right. I blacked out on the couch. And I woke up, didn't know where I was. And I, like, I went back to my psych doc. I'm like, why did you give this to me? Yeah. Like, well, like the help with stress. I'm like, this is terrible. Like I couldn't do anything. Right. Like I could not function. Like I can't take these. I have a job. I'm, I'm in school. Like I'm an adult human being. Yeah, yeah. Like I have things to do. And she's like, well, people take like three to five of these a day. I'm like, how do they get anything done? She's like, well, they don't. I'm like, how does that yeah. seem effective for me? Yeah. It was, it was really furious. I was like, impurity, man. So I, I knew like it was time to get out of the Air Force and retire. Mm-hmm. Like I wanted to be in Utah. Like we were, we were all done with it. Like I was like getting pissed off about having to like blast my boots and wear a PC outside. I'm like, what, why do I look like a, a, a garbage man or bus driver right now? Like, what's the point of this? Right. Like, why do I have to get a flu shot? Why do I have to take a PT test? I've yeah, proven yeah. that I can get a, a max on a PT score my whole career. Like at some point, just assume the fact that I'm not going to be a complete dirtbag. Right. And let me not take PT tests. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just, it was clearly it was time to go. Sure. Um, but one thing about the guard, uh, and this is kind of how we get to the end of my career, uh, that really helped me. And I don't think would have happened if I had stayed, cause I'd been the 17th, you know, debt to guy and maybe gone to Benning or maybe gone to her field, like to do like some staff time. You know, I, I wouldn't have gotten away from it. Right. I would just stay kind of in it, you know, to degrees. Uh, and I don't think, um, it would have provided me the, the, the space that the guard did to really start playing my exit. Yeah, I started playing my exit like three years out because I knew like pretty quickly after getting to New York, I was like, this is not for me forever. Right. This is a great opportunity and it solves a problem. Um, it was not a great opportunity. Like it's not forever. Sure. Like Syracuse, New York is not our jam. Um, it was when I was like 21 imparting at uh Syracuse university right. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not doing that anymore yeah, yeah um so i actually i i uh i had a very deliberate planning process for my exfil nice. for retirement um you know i i uh i wrote a, the five phases of a direct action raid i wrote that for getting out of the military yeah and I, I had all five phases 
Um, I had min force requirements. I had appendices. <laughs> I mean, I don't, it was just a word document, really. Like, it wasn't like some sexy like thing. It just it helped me tie my things in. Did backward playing timeline process. Yeah. And and uh and that's kind of and like I got my got grad school done. Um, and that's kind of really what helped me get out of the Air Force well. But even the retirement was weird. Um, because I did skills bridge, um, which is the, the internship you can do the six months before you get out. Or yeah. I think they changed the rules now based off rank structure. Um, but I did a skills bridge that got me back to Utah. Nice. Um, and, uh, it was right. I, my skills were started three months before the government shut down or the, the country shut down for COVID. Oh, okay. Um, and, um, so I didn't go back to New York to retire. I retired over the phone. <laughs> like, and when I say retire the phone, it was checking with the MPF, the, the military personnel flight or whatever it was. And like, it was like, Hey man, all your documents are good. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> that was, that was, that was my retirement. Jeez. Um, and it wasn't like, oh, I can, like, and not like a, I need to thank you for my service. That's not what I'm saying. Like, it was just not like a retirement like you'd think. It was just like literally like, hey, like I called the hotline and made sure that my documents were good to file. And they're like, yeah, you're good. I'm like, I'm like thanks, guys. Yeah, it's very that anticlimactic it. for a, you know, a, a 21 year career of military service. It was just fascinating. A phone call. <laughs> like, like, and, and it, it was so crazy. Uh, it's just a phone call. And like, uh, it was interesting too, because. Like three days after the country shut down, like Utah just like eight point something on the Richter scale earthquake. Uh, I was and I was like, guys, I'm. I told told New York, I was like, I'm not leaving my family right now. This right. the country's too weird. Everything's all caca. Like I'm, I'm not leaving my family. Um, you know, and uh, so and then I I I, I got the Air Force and got my first job at L3 Harris, um, as a product manager and um. The interesting product, the product I was using was the product that created my downfall in Alaska. Oh, the product I was managing. I, I became the product manager for all rovers. Isn't that weird? <laughs> it is weird. Isn't that funny? Um, it's super funny. Uh, and, you know, I never thought I wanted to do defense industry, but now that I'm doing it, like, I can't probably imagine doing anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, like, L3 Harris was a great experience for two years. I got a I got a really good exposure to the industry. I had a terrible boss. Um, he yelled at my engineers one day. My engineers were busting their ass uh, to do this thing that was kind of like a side project, like passion project that wasn't actually really funded. And they'd achieved more on this idea than had ever been achieved. And it was also not funded and like he called them and yelled at them cause it wasn't good enough. And like, at that point I was like, Hey, I'm not working for you anymore. And B I'm going to do exactly what I need to do to not get fired until I find a new job. Yeah. Because like, I'm not, I'm not doing this man. Like, like, and, but it was a, like an L3 Harris is a great company. They make great products. Um, I just, it just wasn't for me, man. Yeah. Uh, so I ended up going to Panasonic, which is really weird to be their leader of strategic business development, which is just, my job was to find new opportunities or is what it boiled down to for the federal team and specifically for the end user device. So the chest worn like phone that all the guys wear, the right. Samsung stuff like Panasonic has a really great device. It's called the N1T. Um, it's rugged eyes. It, it, it checks 98% of the blocks. And we were on the five yard line of beating Samsung. Yeah. And then Panasonic, which is a Japanese run company said, we're not doing that anymore. They killed the product. Wow. My job was safe. Like I, like my job was weirdly safe. Like they fired my boss and a bunch of other people. My boss was amazing at Panasonic, but my job was like weirdly safe. And I was like, well, my friends don't care about laptops. Like they just, they have a laptop in their, their, their locker. That's great. But they don't care about laptops. Right. Like the, the end user device solved the problem. That's gone. I'm going to start looking around quietly. And then um, that's how I ended up where I'm at right now. Which is a company called Skydio. Uh, they make a uh, make a drone yeah. that is almost like it's extremely autonomous. It is as machine learning. It's it senses its environment. It operates in GPS denied and, and EMS contested environments. It's honestly not just I work there. It is like literally the best 
drone in its category in the industry period. Nice. Um, and I am responsible and I'm in sales and also did not think I wanted to do sales. Um, I realized that I actually really like sales. Um, and, uh, I'm responsible to all the air force space force space force <laughs> and civil air patrol growth. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I do now. And, um, I kind of owe it all to this, in my opinion, to this, uh, really deliberate planning process I put in for, for my exit strategy. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, and that's why, like when people ask me how retirement is in, in my career, I'm like, dude, it's amazing. I, I could not love being retired more than I do. I'm really fortunate to be able to say that because even though El Tamaris is my favorite experience, like I've had really good opportunities the whole time I've been out of the military. I, have, I haven't had to like kind of flounder or struggle between spaces. I'm not saying they won't happen at some point, mm -hmm. but um, I, I've, uh, I've had the opportunity uh, to do really well. And I, I think it's because of my ex exit plan. Yeah. So I'm actually like weirdly passionate about that. Um, for guys. No, it's a good point. So, yeah, man, that's, I, yeah. that's my life. That's my career. Um, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it, like we were talking to, um, like we harp on that a lot, the importance of preparing to get out. Don't just get out. Don't you make sure you have a plan and kind of like to your point, you have so many more marketable skills than you think you do. Like, you know, just the things that we've done as far as like airspace deconfliction or problem solving or whatever it is, you know, people don't give themselves enough credit and where uh, you're a perfect shining example of what you can do if you just plan properly and, you know, get out there and get after it. So, yeah, it's awesome. And it kind of goes back to like, I didn't really like, dude, I made the decision to be attacked P like at a, in a conversation in the middle of the night in the barracks. Right. I was like, that sounds cool. I'm doing that. Like that was like, that was my decision making process. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like it wasn't like very well thought out. Right. Like, I mean, it made sense, but it wasn't like, I didn't spend a lot of time deliberating. Like now you come, come forward like 24 years and, uh, you know, maybe some approaches have changed <laughs> a bit. <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't call them mature, but they're better than they were. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, it's, I mean, I, dude, my life is amazing. Yeah. I like, yeah, everyone's life is hard. Like people have tough times, but, uh, Dude, my life is like everything's my wife is freaking beautiful our kid is amazing uh see like it's awesome but it's kind of like we were talking about i mean you you know you you had a couple of hiccups you know your wife went through her thing your mother but at, at the end of it if you just keep plugging away and, and don't give up it eventually will work itself out eventually you know and like in a dude i'm so proud i got to be a tech dude. yeah so proud it's one of the coolest things on the planet yeah like, and I'm glad I, like, I had some mistakes, but like, I think I did an okay job in my career. Yeah. You know, um, and I'm really like, it was the most fun, dude. 21 <laughs> years, it was the most fun. For sure. Uh, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Right. I feel the same way. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's my career. I noticed you wrote some stuff down. I always ask people about their initiatives and their some charities or, you know, some causes that you want to talk about. Did you want to talk about any of these yeah. that you wrote down? I will, for sure. Uh, there's one that I left out that I'm an idiot for doing it, but I, I corrected on my notes here. It's Hunter Seven Foundations. It's the first one I want to talk about. So the Hunter Seven Foundation is, I think most guys that listen to the podcast are probably aware, like they are the leading nonprofit to, to help kind of bring awareness to, to cancer-related toxic exposures in veterans. Okay. Um, and I, I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but I have, uh, I, I just, I'm not as familiar, but yeah, I have heard yeah. of them. So they, they are like the leading nonprofit that's not just doing like work, but they're doing congressional efforts to, to bring awareness to, to the, the vast amount of uh, cancers that are occurring in, in veterans right now. Um, you know, and, and kind of how this all came to me, Hunter seven itself is a, my wife had cancer. Um, so I have a, I have a passion for that because she's alive. Thank God. Um, and then, uh, it sucks big time, but, uh, because Christy had cancer, um, one of our teammates, Luke Page, um, he, he had, he ended up with cancer stage four cancer, like a very rare, very rare, like cancer, like 4,000 white dudes that are over 65 get a year. Yeah. Like Luke Page is not that dude. He's young, he's massively fit. Like he's a monster. Um, all of a sudden, like he's got full blown stage four cancer. Uh, I forget who told me about it and I reached out to Luke and then I had a friend who knew about Hunter seven because Luke was trying to get care at the Mayo clinic. Cause they were doing it's like they were doing clinical trials on his specific type of cancer, but 
but the VA was like, no, we're not going to pay for that. Dude, Hunter Seven mobilized the entire federal and state legislative body of but Florida, mm. the whole like the whole legislative body, like from the governor of uh, Florida, both like Democrat and Republican, like uh, senators and congressmen, like from state and federal, like they mobilized the whole thing and got Luke to the Mayo Clinic. Nice. Um, he went into remission. He got more time with his family. Unfortunately, the cancer came back and uh, it came back pretty quickly, uh, pretty aggressively, and he ended up passing away. But that's so 107 it, it, of all the foundations, of all the charities, like uh, especially guys, like the Air Force is like one of the, the, the largest like res- recipients, but like diagnoses of cancer because they're just sucking down jet fumes all day, right? Apparently. Um, but 107, they're doing like incredible work to, uh, to help prevent these things to include like um, early de- early detection is the biggest thing right yeah. like my wife we she had we knew she had a problem for like a year but they wouldn't test for it so that's why i got the stage three early detection is the, the biggest thing possible right um so they do a ton of fundraising um they just fundraise like just black rubber coffee the ufc and hunter seven just all kind of fundraised together like at the latest ufc fight in oh, New York I, I City. Did see and, like, yeah that's right so dude, like if anyone has a, a dollar to spare they should and they should go to the Hunter Stem Foundation first, in my opinion. Um, you know, and I'm really good friends with those guys. And then we have a non like we have a nonprofit. So my family's my wife's family, we manage ten thousand acres of mountain here in Utah. Um and uh through a we run it we manage it through a foundation and we partner with a nonprofit called Hunter the Brave. And what that means is uh because of the way the property is structured and the foundation and then work with Hunter the Brave we can get all expense paid once in a lifetime elk, mule deer, and moose hunts for veterans. Wow. That's awesome. Um, Jordan Jacob, Jordan Jacob, he's been out here. Ryan Duhon's been out here. Jason Hoover's been out here. Brian Schieffer, I uh, was here. Um, we've had 160 well, pilots. We had Vietnam veterans. Um, uh, we've had, you know, green berets. Uh, this last season, we just had Earl Plumley, who's a medal bond recipient um, out here. Um, so basically that's our family's, um, our family's effort to get back to veterans. That's awesome. Um, with that mountain. And then one that Jordan mentioned that I'll mention too is the honor foundation. Oh yeah. Um, so that's a three month, three and a half month long fellowship. I was the, like the honor foundation took a chance on me because I was, I was the first, I'll say TAC P to go through, but I wasn't even a TAC P at the time. I was a guard Intel nerd. Oh, right. Um, you know, and it was kind of the same thing where, you know, if you're a TAC P, wherever you go, people think that's what a TAC P is. Mm-hmm. I was like, if I'm the first guy to go through this thing and I want my friends to be able to do it too, like I can't suck at this. All right. Um, I wanted to leave a good impression. Uh, I think it's worked. I'm an ambassador and a mentor for the Honor Foundation. And I think there's TAC P's in every class at this point. Nice. Um, and, they're, and they're constantly expanding. I've got a few others on here, like Elite Meet, 51 Vets, and Breakline Academy. Those are simply just other transition programs that the guys should be looking at. So Elite Meet, 51 Vets, and Breakline Academy. Those are all transition programs that guys should be looking at as they plan their exit because they all create avenues of access to industry and mentorship and increase your chances of having a really good transition plan. Okay. Where you're not like kind of like stuck taking a low-paying job or stuck without a job for a period of time. And also, like the Honor Foundation, one of the biggest things they do is build your network. Right. My phone, I consider it priceless because of the quality of people in my in my network now that I can reach out to to help other people. Okay. Um, you know, so and then the last one is vets. So veterans and sport treatment solutions. I don't know if anyone's talked about that one yet. I think JT may may have touched on it a little bit, but um, probably please go. So ahead. So that's like the they're they're the leading um, psychedelic like a healing grant like nonprofit run by a Navy SEAL and his wife, a former Navy SEAL and his wife. Basically they, they send you to Mexico in this, and it's a, it's, it's like a freaking day spa of a place, but you're doing some very serious work there. Mm-hmm. And the reason I went is because JT had gone and he reached out to me. He's like, Hey man, you need, you need to go. And this is, you know, I've been maybe out of the military for a year. We just had our son. He was three months old. And my wife looked at me one time and, and my wife's like the nicest human being on the planet. And she's like, man, like you are ugly inside and out right now. And I, I do not love what's happening right here. And she's like, you need to go. Wow. Sweet. 
Um, I went, it was really hard. Like people like sometimes don't think like, like, Oh, you're just gonna go do psychedelics. It'll be fun. Like it was hard. Like you, like it, it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's like, uh, you know? it's like a medical procedure. It's not, it's not like, uh, you know, out there just having fun. I mean, you're, this is like a, it's a, not, I don't want to say medical, but like, it's a, it's a mental challenge for you, isn't it? It's, I mean, I haven't done it, but uh, it's, it's everyone's has their own experience with it. Um, but man, like, it it was really so jt was like hey man it's like the hardest thing you ever do like i'm like okay cool like like one percent harder like two percent harder mm-hmm. like i've done some hard things like how hard and i told jt afterwards i'm like yo dude you you lied to me about this he's like what do you mean I'm like you said this is the hardest thing i've ever done i will ever do he's like yeah i'm like what you should have said is the hardest thing you've ever done will pale in comparison to how hard this will be for you <laughs> that is a more accurate representation of like the challenge yeah. that is however um it literally changed my life yeah. like all like the the pts stuff and the anxiety stuff like it's still there like i still have it but it's not like this blaring like you know fog horn of like caca in my face all the time i can like it's i can manage the volume fairly well now um like well, a, a, an acute example is i have no problem falling asleep but before i went to mexico every night i would have violent combat dreams like i'm getting murdered i'm like something something suboptimal is happening and i'm going to wake up because i don't want to have the dream anymore and i won't go back to sleep at that point wow like so that was before before mexico yeah and since mexico that happens like one percent of the time and by the way when i was doing the medicine doing the psychedelics I had almost no combat related like psychedelic experience. I thought I was gonna be like, oh God, it's just gonna be like almost nothing. Like of my psychedelic experience was associated with combat. Wow. Um, but that that's just an acute example. There's a lot more to it, but like to give people an example as they listen to this podcast, like what are the outcomes? Like one of my biggest outcomes was I can sleep and not be terrified about what I'm gonna see when I fall asleep. Yeah. Um, and that was huge. Um, but uh, and it also go back to like when they prescribed me Xanax, they also gave me like antidepressants and all the things. I don't take anything. I don't take anything. Yeah. It is. This is the only thing for me personally that I've seen have a significant lasting benefit. What was, uh, uh, so it wasn't combat related, but what, what kind of experiences were you having? Was it more childhood trauma or was it just. Yeah. Childhood trauma, but like, not like, yeah. So it was childhood trauma, but like, uh, it wasn't like, um, I was just getting my ass kicked the whole time. I can't say more. Um, it was just, it was like senses and feelings, and it's really hard to explain. We call it like a multi sensory experience. Yeah. But like, for example, my, my dad died, right, when I was young. I've always wondered if my, my dad knows he's dead. That's like a weird question, right? Right. Um, so I didn't know that bothered me. Um, so I ended up living my dad's death for him. Wow. Like, because my dad died on an operating table, open heart surgery. I did that for him. Like I didn't, it's for me really, but like I had that experience. Wow. <laughs> and now I no longer have that question. I'm not like, it doesn't bother me. Okay. Right. Um, and like my relationship with my mom wasn't like super hot. Um, and I wanted to address that. Like, dude, that's a, it's a no factor Yeah. for me. It's a no factor. Um, it's not like it didn't happen or like it's not there. But like it's it's over there somewhere. And if I want to go check it out and like spend some time with it, I can. But it's not like just like smack me across the face all the time. You, like just like yeah, you're more in control than uh, controlling you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so yeah, it wasn't a lot of combat stuff, and uh, and uh, also things like so I was I was scared while I was doing it too. Like it was like some of it was scary, and um, so I I, I started bringing up like photos essentially because like I saw the world like this giant panorama mm-hmm. in my experience. I started bringing up photos of my wife and my, my son and they made me feel safe. Nice. So what I realized was like, it's okay to put like your, like it's okay to like not be in the military anymore. It's okay to not be on the team anymore. Like these things are making me feel safe. These are great things for you. Right. Like dude, go home and just hug the shit out of those two right. and have a great life. Um, so like, and that's like a three day experience condensed into like five minutes, but like, uh, I've heard of almost no one coming out of there not feeling better. Same. Everybody I've talked to, uh, 
advocates and people that have experienced it have said nothing but good stuff about it. So there's got to be something to it. Yeah, for sure. It, it, there, there definitely is, man. Um, and it's, it's, it, guys have the opportunity. Dude, I was scared. I didn't want to go. I wanted to leave halfway through. It wasn't like, like it was freaking hard. Yeah. Just do it. It's super important if you're, you're struggling. So yeah, man. Um, and I, yeah, that's like, uh, well, cool, man. <laughs> This this has been awesome. Uh, I I can't thank you enough for doing this. I I love I love ending on stuff like that, like because the, the all the other stuff is important, and I like hearing about you know what you went through as far as your career, but kind of tying it up in a bow with some positive lessons for yourself, but also for other guys is is just great. I think it's great. I, I think you're a good example for other guys that you know if they're having, if they're questioning you know getting some PTS uh, treatment or whatever or business stuff or getting out of the military, whatever it is. I mean, I think you're a good example for all that. So I hope I'm, I'm thinking, I can't thank you enough for sharing, man. Dude, thank you, man. Like you're like going back, like you're a freaking living legend in the community. <laughs> and like, you're creating this, this, uh, this forum for guys to basically like, do like talk therapy and, uh, kind of cap off their careers. Like, this is amazing, dude. Like, and you've had like, like, dude, I, I had a cool career, but I'm not a living legend. I'm not like anyone significant in the community. Like I was a good tech P, but like, you've had some freaking amazing dudes on this podcast. So like for me to get to like be like literally in the same room virtually as these guys, like to get to talk about being attack B and like you're doing that, like you are making this thing available and it's freaking amazing, man. Like, I hope you're like, I hope you're really proud to put it, put oh, it I mundanely. Love it. I, I love it. Um, I love hearing the, I love hearing the story. Like Kelly, like I was talking about, uh, I was talking to a dude yesterday. Um, uh, Kevin Whalen, he, we we hang out with these guys all the time, but we hardly ever dive deep into their lives, you know. And it's it's nice to hear, you know, some guys that we have run into or even shared some time with. Uh, it's nice to hear their stories and kind of get some some firsthand accounts. I mean, it's really cool. I I love it. I I, it's, I geek out about it all the time. So it's 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 kind of selfish and and a little bit on my part just because I get to hear all these stories. So it's it's cool. I love it. Yeah, I love it. I'm I'm super appreciative of this and like. Thanks for letting me run my mouth. About oh, my, for sure, stuff. man. It was, it was great having you on. I, I can't thank you enough for doing it. I appreciate it. All right, man. Well, I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend and an amazing Thanksgiving. Yeah, you too. All right, buddy.